Good morning. I'll now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is December 13th, 2022, 9 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Abbott? Aye. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. We'll begin with a moment of silence and followed by a pledge of allegiance. Supervisor McPherson, I believe you had a few words to share with us this morning. Yeah, I'd like to um, say that we remember today a tremendous individual, a great guy, uh, and a tremendous public servant, uh, Judge Paul Maragonda, who passed away. Um, he was uh, a true public servant, a great family man, uh, a great friend. Um, Uh, he, ser he served on the Scotts Valley City Council before he became assistant uh, district attorney. And he was uh, named to be a judge uh, here in Santa Cruz County in uh, December of 2006. And I was very happy to be one that uh, suggested to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger that he be uh, filled the position of a vacant position of judge. Uh, That's me, sorry. Tremendous community, public servant, served this county very well. I'd like us to remember Judge uh, Paul Maragonda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. We'll hold Judge Maragonda in our hearts in this moment of silence. Please rise the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gayo Palacios, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda today? Yes, we do. Uh, on the consent agenda item number 35, there are additional materials, revised memo, packet page 966 replaced, recommended action three should read, direct staff to finalize contract negotiations and return with the final contract for board approval. And then on written correspondence, there's additional material, a proclamation for National Homeless Persons Memorial Day, insert after packet page 2988. That concludes the additions to the agenda. Corrections. Thank you. Moving on to item four, does any board member wish to remove items from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Supervisor Cabot. Uh, I'm not gonna remove it, uh, but if we can, when we vote on the uh, consent agenda, I'd like to just uh, uh, comment on one item. And then uh, I think there's a member of the public. Uh, they said they wanted to make a comment too. Certainly. <laughs> and we'll now proceed with public comment. Any person may address the board during public comment. Speakers shall not exceed two minutes in length. And individuals may speak only once during public comment. All public comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, yet to be heard on the regular agenda or a topic not on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later, either individually or on a subsequent board of supervisors agenda. Super, supervisor, uh, there's a personnel matter on the consent agenda. Oh. Yes, thank you. One moment. Thank 
All right, pursuant to government code section 54953, I'm announcing that this consent agenda includes item 46, which is an amendment to resolution number 279-75 to increase the salary schedule for specified classifications in the unrepresented group, which includes local agency executives. Staff recommendation with detailed information is outlined in the resolution as recommended by the personnel director and county administrative officer. We'll now proceed with public comment. Good morning, board. Is this on? It is. Okay. Thank you. Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner, and uh, Supervisor McPherson, I agree 100% with everything you said about Judge Maragona. He was truly a, a wonderful man. We're going to miss him greatly. Uh, but I, I came by this morning. I'm aware there's an 11 o'clock agenda item to recognize Supervisor Caput and Coonerty, but I have a scheduling conflict. So I wanted to stop by this morning and express my appreciation for Supervisor Caput for your 12 years on the board, Supervisor Coonerty for your eight years on the board. It's been an honor to work with you. We've had some remarkable events occur during your tenure on the board, whether it was the historic rainfalls in 17 and then all the road damage that occurred to a tsunami, to the fires, to a pandemic. And, and in addition to all that, just the day-to-day -day governance of the, of the county. And I, I believe that we owe you guys a debt of gratitude. Uh, we appreciate you. You don't hear it enough, but we appreciate the work that all of you do on this board. You're going to be missed, and I just wish you the best in whatever your next adventure is. And uh, on behalf of the sheriff's office, I have some certificate, or each of you have a certificate of appreciation here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sheriff Hart. Good morning. Oh, you want to reset the timer? Thank you. I want more than 41 seconds. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Drulli, and I'm here today as the chair of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission. As you may know, California Welfare and Institution Codes requires each county to have a Juvenile Justice Commission. Our mission is to advocate for and protect the safety and well being of dependent and juvenile justice youth and to promote intervention and prevention services and programs in Santa Cruz County. Welfare and Institutions Code also mandates that our commission conduct an annual inspection of the juvenile hall to evaluate its practices and to ensure the safety, health, education, and programming requirements for youth at the hall are met. After the inspection is complete, we report our findings, which include making recommendations for areas of nonconformance to the chief probation officer and the board of supervisors. Due to some miscommunications surrounding its submission, a copy of the completed annual juvenile hall inspection report was attached today as written correspondence item N instead of as an agenda item. I'd like to request that the inspection report be put on the agenda for the January 10th meeting so that we can discuss this very comprehensive report, which totals almost 200 pages, and our recommendation to probation and the supervisors. I'd also like to thank um, Supervisor Caput and Supervisor Coonerty, both of whom I've worked with in my past life as director of um, CASA of Santa Cruz County. And uh, thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drilly. Good morning. My name is Tom Reef. I'm known to several of you. Hi, Bruce. Uh, and I'm here just to speak on behalf of uh, Rodeo Gulch Mobile Estates uh, and the fact that the county and thank all of you uh, on the board and your predecessors for supporting rent control in Santa Cruz County, which is not always operating. Uh, I've lived in this mobile home park for 20 years and I could afford to do it because rent is control. That is, it goes up periodically um, uh, as part of the CPI. And so it has risen, but uh, in terms of landowners turning on us and trying to do it, we've seen examples in Capitola and in Santa Cruz in the last 20 years of mass movement of people away from mobile homes because there was uh, basically the uh, rent control ordinances were allowed to lapse by legal action. You folks have stood up to uh, this as recently as five years ago, and you're probably going to be facing that again. And I just wanted to thank you on behalf of all our residents. We have a 255 residents plus in 205 units on four acres. That's a very high density for mid-county. 
and some sense of your support for people with low income. We're all seniors, uh, and uh, we vary in age from 55 uh, on up to our 90s. And while I can't speak for all of them, I have served on their board in various capacities, and I've lived and managed another uh, park uh, as a member of a board. So it's a great adventure. All I want to say is thank you for your support. Um, people uh, will be coming to you at various times over the next year, probably because of the very complex nature of these supports and, and defenses. And I want to thank you on behalf of all the residents in our park. So you all have a Merry Christmas. Smile. Uh, you do great work. And uh, we'll see you around. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Reef. Uh, good morning. My name, uh, good morning, members of the board, uh, Chair Koenig. My name is David Brody. I'm the executive director of First Five Santa Cruz County. Uh, and I'm here today to thank you and Supervisor Friend in particular for proclaiming January 2023 uh, to be the 11th annual Positive Parenting Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. Uh, as many of you know, Positive Parenting Awareness Month is something that started right here in Santa Cruz County, but is now replicated uh, in counties across the state and even statewide through uh, renewed action by our legislature recognizing uh, Positive Parenting Awareness Month uh, in the entire state of California. Uh, as many of you know, this growing movement to recognize that positive parenting is a powerful, recognizing that positive parenting is a powerful predictor uh, of social, emotional, and physical health of our young people, uh, and it acts as a protective factor, helping prevent and heal against childhood or adverse childhood experiences. Um, the importance of positive parenting uh, uh, is um, is important and the importance of evidence-based programs that support positive parenting are equally important. This was recently reinforced, as many of you may know, by the Department um, of, uh, uh, of Healthcare Services and the new Children, Youth, and, and Behavioral Health Initiative uh, that released an RFA in support of positive parenting work and named two, uh, in particular, evidence-based programs out of four in total that it would fund through the statewide initiative, including Triple P and the Healthy Steps Program, which you'd both be familiar, you'd be familiar with both. The first five Santa Cruz County, as you know, we are very proud to uh, manage uh, and operate the Triple P program in concert and coordination uh, with this board, with your health, your health services agency, your human services department, and the probation department, and many community partners. And as you're also well aware, you are champions of the Healthy Steps program implementation in our county uh, through the um, Thrive by Five program. So in summary, I just want to, on behalf of the first five Santa Cruz uh, County Commission, thank you all for recognizing Positive Parenting Awareness Month in 2023, and of course, for being ongoing supporters of children and families in our county. And a special thank you to Supervisor Caput and Supervisor Coonerty uh, at this final meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom DeBono, and I'm a resident of Shoreline Mobile uh, Home Estates on uh, Merrill Street. And I'm here to speak on the agenda item uh, regarding uh, the rent controls and the CPI issue. Uh, totally support it. And um, we have 165 units in there. It's a senior park, uh, 55 and on up. And uh, this is truly an affordable housing complex for uh, the seniors in the county. I've spoken with, uh, emailed with Manu Koning, a supervisor on, uh, you know, this issue in the past. Uh, I know or in his neighborhood, he's got a couple of MOA home parks, and those also are like 100 plus units. So uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, uh, vote on this issue in a favorable manner. And I appreciate all the support that you've given the rent control and supported in, in the past uh, years. But uh, uh, just thank you for looking at that and appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. DeBono. Good morning. Um, just wanted to confirm, Mr. Chair, I'm here for item number 10 on the regular agenda. Would it, the time to be speaking is now or when that item comes up? You're welcome to speak either now or during the item. I'll wait first. for the item then. Okay. Thank you. Morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I don't know the last time I've actually witnessed all five of you here together in person. So uh, December 6th, there were five items on the agenda on the 130, item 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. They're now part of the consent agenda, I believe from 24 to 33. 
unless a citizen makes note that there's some questions about that, they can't take legal action. Um, so there's a couple other items that, you know, I'm just not familiar with. I mean, today must be a record. There's almost 3000 pages in those two binders out there. Um, what can I say? It's just good to be present. It's nice that all of you are here and that's about it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. All right, seeing no one else here in, or if, if anyone else here in chambers would like to comment on the consent agenda or any regular agenda item, please go ahead and speak now. Uh, any item? You may. I just yeah. came a little late here. Yeah. Uh, I'm totally okay, I'm sorry. My name is Antonio Rivas uh, from the city of Guanzumel here. And the only reason I'm coming here before you, I'm very concerned in regard to the Live Oak Senior Center. Um, as you are aware, the planning to close down the Senior Center in Live Oak at the end of this month. That will be the Christmas present for our seniors in Live Oak. It is my hope that the county supervisors be able to step in and hopefully the senior center will not be closed down. It is my hope that maybe the new members of the city, of the county supervisors, the new members be able to bring this LIBO uh, senior center and to put them in the agenda so they can be able to come up with some options. Because the people at LIBO, along with the county, with the seniors at the county of Santa Cruz, they're going to suffer. It is my hope that maybe you can be able to bring this item and put it in the agenda and discuss it and see if we can come up with some options for the senior center at Live Oak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivas. Anyone else here in chambers that would like to comment? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Marianne? Marianne, it looks like you're using an outdated version of Zoom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move to the next speaker unless you're able to um, update that. We can come back to you. Caller ending in 1401. Your microphone is now available. This is Marilyn Garrett. I'd like to refer people to a document. I think it's put out by WestonAPrice.org. The title is COVID Shots for Adults and Children. And you do have an item on the agenda regarded, regarding uh, shots. Uh, what we know now it's very well documented. Here are some of the topics on this. People are doing fine without the shots. The shots won't prevent COVID-19. It could lead to even worse outcomes. Adverse reactions are to be expected. Adverse reactions are not rare. The shots are affecting menstrual cycles and causing miscarriages and could make women sterile. There is ample cause for concern about the COVID shots ingredients, not all of which have been disclosed. The safety of administering COVID shots at the same time as other shots has not been studied. COVID shots are liability free. Under U.S. law, the manufacturers of the COVID shots are protected from all liability. If you are injured, you cannot sue. Who will help with medical bills if you or your child is injured? Who will care for your child? Are you willing to take the risk? And here are some additional sources, a documentary titled MRNA Vaccine Genocide. CP, your microphone is now available. 
Hi, thank you. My name is Cindy Pierce and I live at uh, Shoreline Mobile Home Estates. And I also urge you to adopt the proposed amendments to the county's mobile home park rent adjustment ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Michael, your microphone is now available. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, you may be aware that there's been some problems with the online agenda since Thursday. It's been up and down and up and down. When I tried to uh, start the meeting this morning using the link from the online interactive agenda, the uh, Zoom ID that is posted on the agenda this morning is incorrect. I had to go to the PDF copy of the agenda to find the correct uh, ID number that would allow me to join. So there may be a number of people who have been trying to uh, join this meeting today who could not using the online interactive agenda. Thank Link. you. Thank you, Lewis. Norma, your microphone is now available. Good morning. My name is Norma Malat, and I am a mobile home owner in the Rodale Gulch Mobile Home Park, and I strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to adopt the proposed amendments to the county's mobile home park rent adjustment ordinance. I thank you for doing so, and I thank you for all that you do. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Ms. Malat. <laughs> Jan, your microphone is now available. Good morning. I am a mobile home owner in Shoreline Estates Mobile Park. I urge you to adopt the proposed amendments to the county's mobile home park rent adjustment ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. We have no further speakers at this time, Chair. We have one more speaker here in Chambers. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. What a great pleasure to see all five of you here in person. This is really great. It's been a long time, over two years. I would like to um, speak consent agenda item 17 regarding shared work, uh, regarding uh, remote and hybrid workspace for county employees. I would like to propose uh, that the board consider offering shared parking space to those uh, hybrid employees so that when they are here working their two days a week, that they can be uh, staggered and actually share parking spaces in the lot at 701, it could reduce their cost for parking here and it could also free up parking spaces for the public and for jurors, which is really hard to find many, many times. I would like to speak with you about item number 23, your decision last week to change the Fire Department Advisory Commission residency requirement. Under this change, um, those who serve the rural people in County Service Area 48 as their commissioners will not even have to be part of CSA 48. They could be urban dwellers. And I told you last week, I'll tell you again, this is a disservice, a, a real disservice to those of us who live in County Service Area 48 and uh, depend on the commissioners as our voice to you for recommendations. This group makes budgetary proposals, policy changes. If they're not affected and they have no idea what county fire is, we are not being served well. And this happened, you know, Supervisor McPherson in the CSA 48 2020 uh, special benefit. It was the FDAC that did all that work, working with your office, but they did the work. So please do not pass this change. It will not serve the people well. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Uh, I also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Yeah. All right, so no further public comment, I'll return to the board for action on the consent 
Chair, we've had one more. We oh. have one more speaker online. Okay, thank you. Karen, your microphone is now available. Thank you. I am Karen Lynn. I also live at Rodeo Gulch, and I want to thank you all for supporting us as mobile home and especially senior mobile home park uh, uh, mobile home owners, and to keep the rent affordable for us. Thank you very much for having our backs. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Thank you, we have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then now I'll return to the board for action on the consent agenda. Okay, uh, I'll move to approve, but I'll uh, make a comment on uh, item 55. Go ahead, Supervisor Caput. You go ahead. Okay. Did but you want to comment wait. on item? No, go ahead, now's the appropriate time. All right, uh, I'm, uh, I'm probably one of the few in the audience that remembers this. Uh, item 55, deals with uh, bathrooms that are locked up when you go to get coffee, like at Starbucks, the one here in the parking lot. Uh, they have all the bathrooms locked up and people can't use them or whatever. So item 55 is looking at that. Now, when I say I'm old enough to remember, uh, maybe Supervisor McPherson will remember this. Back in the 1950s, uh, uh, my mother used to have to carry, uh, she had to have nickels in her uh, in her purse uh, because you had to put a nickel uh, to uh, be able to use the bathroom, to be able to go to the bathroom in a public restroom. Uh, so that, that goes back a long time ago. There was a woman in the 1950s that was a, a regular uh, mother, um, housewife, whatever. And uh, she got on a campaign. Her name was March Fong Yu. And uh, she became known uh, and it went national that she came out and said, that's not fair. It's not right that you have to have a nickel to use the bathroom. And it was very difficult for mothers uh, with kids and all that to go in and use the restroom. Anyway, she went on to, uh, to a political career and got elected year after year as Secretary of State of the State of California. And uh, she was a very popular uh, politician uh, for many years. So anyway, and also uh, a quick story, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Haskell Dane in Watsonville was a uh, 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 Baptist preacher, and when he got older, uh, he had to have uh, radiation treatment, uh, and he had to go from Watsonville, drive his car from Watsonville to Monterey. So when he got about halfway, there was a barn on the uh, uh, near Castorville, and so he would pull in uh, to that barn, and then he'd run around the back of the barn and go to the bathroom and then get back in the car and go on to Monterey. Well, the, the farmer came out finally uh, that was working in the field and caught him and said, what are you doing? Three times a week, you're coming in, you're going behind my uh, barn or whatever. And he said, well, I'm getting radiation treatment for cancer, and I can't hold it. I can only go so far and I have to, you know, go to the bathroom. So what I'm getting at is we have a lot of people with disabilities. We have a lot of older people uh, that are getting uh, maybe treatment, medical treatment and whatever. Uh, all they have to do is put a combination maybe on the uh, bathroom and give the code out. I know that there's a problem with uh, the homeless situation. But anyway, uh, it just, uh, in my final shot here on the uh, board, I thought it would be a good idea to have some kind of ordinance locally to require businesses that are open uh, that uh, have to have a bathroom uh, for people. And I know uh, uh, Antonio Rivas is uh, former mayor of Watsonville, and uh, he's here and he'll comment too. Thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Caput. Um, Mr. Rivas, I, I do appreciate that and recognize that uh, you support item 55. We've uh, had public comment period, so I'm going to... Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. 
Bye. But but, I, but your your support is noted. Thank you. Yeah, I support that. Okay. Thanks, Antonio. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Any other yet, Supervisor Coonerty? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I want to thank the uh, staff for making our, our my last meeting a small, easy agenda. Just ease me out the door. But uh, thousands of page later, thousands of page later, uh, I just have a couple comments I wanted to make. Um, the first is on item number fifty-eight, which is the public defender report. I just want to appreciate our public defender Heather Rogers um, for really focusing on outcomes uh, in a report. Um, and in her department's operations. And I think um, that in collaboration with the other justice partners could have a, make a real impact, uh, a positive impact in our community. Um, and uh, I wanna commend it and I hope it continues. On item number th uh, 75, which is Thrive by Five, I just wanna note that uh, we had some really remarkable outcomes for, uh, for babies and young uh, and toddlers in our community have reduced poverty, uh, fewer low-weight babies, more prenatal care, um, and that um, I'm just thrilled with the pro this program and the way that uh, we've been able to invest in moms and babies, and it's gonna have a generational impact. Um, Finally, uh, well, actually, two more items. One is on a 78, which is a vacation rentals. Um, I, I just wanted to note that um, that when we sent out these letters to 500 vacation rentals, there was one number and one staff member who had to take uh, all the calls. Uh, and I want to appreciate uh, Patty in planning uh, for... Uh, Oh, right over here for uh for for taking that burden i think it's one of those things that like um you know when we pass policy we don't think about the folks who are on the front lines uh as often and i i heard it was an experience and i just want to appreciate you for uh for doing that and then finally cynthia drewley um for the Juvenile Justice Commission, um, the amount of time and effort that those citizens put in to do that facilities report uh, is remarkable, as many of our commissioners are um, in their volunteer efforts. And I want to take a second to appreciate the professionalism and thoughtfulness of of uh, their inspection of our facility, which is uh, which houses children. And it's incredibly important that we have that oversight. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of brief things. First, I'll just register a no vote on item 19. On item 78, which is the, uh, as Supervisor Coonerty had mentioned, deals with the enforcement efforts on short-term rentals. I'd requested that this item had come back. So a lot of appreciation for the amount of work, uh, hundreds of hours as it, as it showed in order to do this. It did show to me that there are some pretty significant gaps though uh, in both resources and our own internal systems communicating that need to be remedied uh, moving forward because ultimately we've been through multiple iterations of this ordinance uh, and we clearly did not set up a structure to actually allow for enforcement of the ordinance. And so if you were an individual operating illegally of those that we know, because the ones that we know are the ones that are actually paying taxes. So I'm sure there's hundreds more that that aren't. We can assume that there's hundreds that were actually paying taxes outside of our system. We really have no incentive under our current ordinance to actually do anything because we're saying right here in this board letter that we don't have the resources to do any enforcement. So given the fact that we just passed uh, the voters passed uh, an increase in the TOT associated with this. So to me, there's clearly should be some resources dedicated from that to go back to uh, planning to help with this enforcement process. And uh, it was actually committed to in the ballot language anyway. But I do think that, uh, especially working with the auditor's office, and I, I see that the, that uh, our auditors here. We need, an, and I see that there have been some system improvements and changes on the movement and platform, but we clearly need a system that shouldn't take 500 hours to see whether somebody's registered or not. I mean, this isn't, there are ways to write code to actually have things communicate with each other so that we can, the two systems can communicate in a way that makes people's lives a heck of a lot easier on the enforcement side. And we need to be able to ensure that those that are following the rules within the, the uh, neighborhoods are, are um, rewarded and those that are problematic within neighborhoods are not. We don't even have a good section, a good way to correct data on whether or not people are actually violating. I mean, we have uh, the sheriff's office uh, is now having these regularly scheduled meetings. These these calls that come in are not necessarily coded or associated with vacation rentals. Given the fact that we we uh, our ordinance is also lacking in requiring that there be a permit number in the actual language on the posting, I think it's difficult to do a simple cross check like other communities have. 
It's a long way of me saying that I support these recommended actions, but it's clear that we need to do more. We're, we obviously are lacking in, in the regard of enforcement on this. We have resources coming in now with the TOT. So my expectation would be uh, when this item comes back or in a mid-year budget component that it's that we provide the needed resources associated with the planning department to ensure that, that we can improve the enforcement on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor McPherson. Yes, uh, I'd like to comment on one uh, item number 48, the Equal Employment Opportunity and Cultural Competency Plan. I especially want to thank uh, the CAO and the personnel departments and the commissions uh, for providing this report to the board. Uh, and thank you to the commissions in particular. Uh, they've worked really hard on this uh, multi-page uh, report. I was glad to see that the county continues to increase representation of women and people of color with, uh, within the county workforce, especially in the areas of administration and protective services. Uh, we have some areas that still need improvement. We recognize that, but I know we're committed to having our county workforce uh, mirror the community and ensure that we are in and ensure that we are encouraging diversity and equity through the recruiting and hiring process. So I, I especially want to thank uh, our CEO, Carlos Palacios, to putting this on the front page, literally, uh, for uh, our, our county operations and this county board of supervisors, too, that has always been uh, front and center in uh, making sure that we promote equity for everyone in our personnel department. And uh, I really do appreciate what they've done. And I, I'm really proud of what the county is doing and what it will do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. On item 67, accepting the completion of six shallow monitoring wells for Mid-County Groundwater Basin. I'd just like to congratulate the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and thank County Resources Manager Sierra Ryan on the completion of these six monitoring wells. As our county faces uncertainty of our water supply, these monitoring wells are a part of a sustainable groundwater system that we're building to be able to collect surface water during rainy days like we've been having and stored in the ground uh, for those hot summer days ahead. These monitoring wells will tell us just where we're at in terms of aquifer levels, and I think this progress is very reassuring. On item 78, the report on proactive short-term rental enforcement efforts. Uh, you know, first, if want to, uh, you know, lest anyone get any ideas uh, from from this report, I think that we actually have been pretty effective as far as collecting the transient uh, occupancy taxes in our our auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector's office. And really, what, where we need to step up efforts is, as uh, Supervisor Friend said, on enforcement against uh, problem vacation rentals that are bothering their neighbors or lack of permit from our planning department. So I also want to acknowledge the efforts of our code compliance and planning staff on this, as it was noted uh, by Supervisor Coonerty. It took over 500 hours that they invested in this. Uh, we have gotten some substantial improvements. I appreciate the new button on the website that makes it a lot easier to report a vacation rental violation. I appreciate the initial conversations with the sheriff's office to improve tracking of complaints. Uh, I think we have a ways to go there still, but it was a good step in the right direction. Um, and of course, just the process of beginning to share data between the planning department and the auditor, auditor controller, treasurer, tax collector's office is, is a good uh, step. So for next steps, I'm looking forward to further discussions about uh, increasing staffing during the mid-year budget hearings. Thank you. Is there a motion? Uh, I'll move. No, it was to approve. Second. I motion to approve the consent agenda with a second uh, by Supervisor Caput, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? And Koenig? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously with a no vote registered from Supervisor Friend on item 19. Thank you. We will now proceed with agenda item 7 which is a public hearing to consider a resolution approving amendments to the unified fee schedule as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And for a presentation on this item, we have our county budget manager, Marcus Pimentel, and Mike Ars, our associate administrative analyst. Good morning, board. Uh, thank you. I am your county budget manager, Marcus Pimentel. Thank you for holding today's public hearing on the proposed amendments to our unified fee schedule. Um, this is my quickest presentation ever. Um, I'm going to turn the rest of the show over to our associate administrative analyst, Maite Arce, who's going to do, provide the overview. And we have departments here who are available for questions. Good morning, members of the board. I am Maite Arce from the County Administrative Office. Maite, if you could just use your microphone, please. Thank you. Press the button. 
it is green. Okay, just get a little closer. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Good morning, members of the board. I am Maite Arce from the County Administrative Office. Twice each year in June and December, the board adopts amendments to the unified fee schedule. On November 15, 2022, the board set a public hearing for today for the latest proposed amendments. There are revisions from the Clerk Elections Office, the Community Development and Infrastructure, Public Works, Parks, Health Services, and the Sheriff's Office. Representatives from each department are available to answer any questions. It is recommended that your board open the public hearing for comment, close the public hearing, and then adopt the resolution revising the unified fee schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arce. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. Um, I, I always uh, investigate these issues because um, I find them interesting. And I know that the fees for res reservations of certain parks is going to go up. And I do not think that is uh, necessary because the voters passed Measure G and that gave uh, quite a lot of sales tax money to support the parks. And uh, Aptos Village Park was one of them. In the ballot language, um, fine print, it said that Aptos Village Park would get $435,000 from this tax. And it's gotten none. <laughs> so to raise the, the fees for people to use the park, I feel is, is not in the public's best interest, especially when the voters have approved money to support that park and others that are also going to experience fee increases. I also want to point out to your board that the most substantial fee increase I saw in reading the documentation was the application fee, fee for concealed uh, firearms. Uh, going from $25 to $474. Um, I spoke with a couple of law enforcement people coming up in the elevator. They say it does not affect law enforcement people. They are allowed to have concealed carry permits free of charge, but it will affect the public. And I would like your board to request uh, law enforcement staff to uh, verify why this uh, extreme increase in cost is coming about and what improvement in service and public safety it will provide. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Anyone else here in chambers who wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Call in user 1401, your microphone is now available. I wanted to thank Becky Steinbrunner for her research all the time on these agenda items and uh, letting the public know the implications. I um, was uh, agreeing with what she said about the park fees. I had no idea um, why hasn't the money gone to the parks as so designated. And public parks should be available for people always our taxes pay for them at um, not additional costs. So thank you, Becky. That's the end of my comments. Thank you. We have no further speakers for this item, Chair. All right, then I'll close the public hearing and return to the board for action. With the recommended action. Second. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor Friend to adopt the recommended actions. Any further discussion? I will just add, uh, you know, there was a one question raised about fees, particularly for concealed carry permits. Um, really, the Board of Supervisors may not uh, levy fees that are beyond reasonably necessary, uh, those reasonably necessary to cover costs. So um, it's fees for uh, issuing a concealed carry permit have gone up. I think it's probably because of the extensive amount of background research that is required for that. Uh, it's a lot of staff time. Um, and, you know, again, we're not uh, legally allowed to charge anything more than just cost recovery for this. So uh, with that, there's no further discussion. Roll call vote, please. 
Supervisor Friend? Aye. Swinnerty? Aye. Rapid? Aye. McPherson? And Koenig? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, staff. We'll now proceed with item eight, which is to consider the terms and conditions of the purchase and sale agreement to acquire real property located at 5,300 SoCal Avenue, Santa Cruz APN 029-02155, and authorize the Deputy CAO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure to execute the purchase and sale agreement on behalf of the county, and authorize the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure to complete the feasibility studies required to waive the contingency set forth in the purchase and sale agreement, uh, and so forth. We'll now have a presentation on the item by our real property manager, Kimberly Finley, and Tiffany Cantrell Warren, our uh, associate, uh, assistant director of health services agency, and Monica Morales, our director of the health services agency. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Kimberly Finley. I'm the Chief Rural Property Agent with the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure. I appear before you today to recommend execution of a purchase and sale agreement to purchase real property located at 5300 SoCal Avenue to serve as a children's crisis center. The 5300 SoCal Avenue property is improved with a 30,220 square foot, two-story multi-tenant flex office building. The building was constructed in 2001 with a concrete slab foundation, reinforced concrete and wood building frame, and is comprised of 11% warehouse. The parcel is approximately 0.47 acres with 59 dedicated parking spaces and shared use of an additional 300 parking spaces. The purchase as proposed is 100% grant funded. The property is located in Midtown off Highway 1 at SoCal Avenue and Chanticleer Avenue. It is located on the shared campus with the existing Sheriff's Public Safety Center. It is close to Dominican Hospital and the location of the proposed Kaiser campus. The property is envisioned as a children's crisis stabilization unit and short-term residential therapeutic program to be operated by the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency. The proposed new program will support youth in crisis on a local level as opposed to being sent out of county for hospitalization. Additionally, the program will be designed to address and reduce the behavioral health disparities that exist for the Latinx youth and families in our county and will provide bilingual care. As part of the initial feasibility work for the property, HSA hired an architect to create the initial design of the proposed program floor plan. The architect created a test fit visual model based on the as-built drawings of the property and has confirmed that the property will meet the space needs of the program. To further discuss the community needs and detail of the program, I will pass the presentation to Monica Morales, Director of the uh, Health Services Agency. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for having us here today. This is a very important initiative um, for us in our community. And many of you have met with me and discussed the needs for behavioral health services for our youth. And so this is such an amazing opportunity for us to really build the system of behavioral health um, for our youth in our community. As you guys are aware, currently, we do have a crisis stabilization uh, unit in our county, but unfortunately, it's way uh, under uh, the capacities not there for the need that we have in our community. We know that our hospitals are struggling right now with diversion options for youth and adults. And so for us, this is going to be a significant opportunity to really expand that care. Um, one of the issues for us is the space. And so what an opportunity now that we were able to identify this building. And so I'm really urging the board to consider approving the uh, purchase of this facility. What really we're planning for is that we would actually expand our crisis stabilization programming from four bits to eight. And that's quite significant for us. It would be almost doubling. 
currently what we're experiencing, unfortunately, is that sometimes we don't have any beds available. That's where you see the range from zero to four currently. And so what we're hoping is not only will we have the ability to stabilize our youth, we actually will also have the ability to provide residential uh, programming for them. So that means that we stabilize them, we then move them even within our county into a residential program. Currently, we have to send our children out of county. And so that's devastating, not only for the youth, it's devastating for the families and even for the system that we have here, because we have to spend resources on travel resources and our staff and the families themselves also have to spend resources to travel out of county. So what we're seeing is that we'll go from having zero support on our residential to 16 potential beds, a significant improvement for us. We have worked on the strategic plan that you set forth. As you can tell, this meets one of our key indicators, which is really expanding the integration of behavioral health services. So it goes and it's very much aligned with what the community needs, what the board had set forth for our um, county and specifically for the vision of HSA as well. To support this project, HSA has already obtained approximately 13 million from grants and other sources. Additionally, HSA was recently awarded a grant of just under 12 million from the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, and HSA is currently investigating whether these funds could be applied to future tenant improvements for the program. The total available and potential grant funds available are currently $24,770,000. The real property section has negotiated a purchase price of $7.9 million for 5300 SoCal Avenue, which equates to $261.42 per square foot of gross building. The purchase property of 7.9 plus the feasibility, which will need to occur, the soft costs and the potential tenant relocations are anticipated to equal $9.5 million for the full acquisition. Based on this $9.5 million acquisition cost and the total available and potential grant funds, this will leave approximately $15 million left for potential tenant improvements in the future. So next steps. The purchase and sale agreement contains a 150-day escrow period. This includes a 120-day physical contingency period. During this term, real property will complete a facility condition assessment, asbestos survey, lead-based paint inspection, mold inspection, short-term radon testing, ADA assessment, and seismic investigations. If the property is determined to be a sound investment based on investigations, county will waive the contingencies and move towards the 30-day close of escrow. After close of escrow, the capital, to, uh, capital Projects Division of CDI will begin implementation of a project to convert the building to the Children's Crisis Center, which will include a zone change, CEQA review, an RFQ for final design, and a return to the Board of Supervisors for approval to bid the project. Based on the following, we now recommend the Board approve and accept the terms and conditions of the purchase and sale agreement to acquire real property located at 5300 SoCal Avenue, Santa Cruz, APN 029-02155. Authorize the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure to execute the purchase and sale agreement on behalf of the county. Authorize the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure to complete the feasibility studies necessary to waive contingencies set forth in the purchase and sale agreement. Authorize the close of escrow if and when all contingencies are met pursuant to the terms of the purchase and sale agreement. And authorize the chair of the board to execute the certificate of acceptance for the associated deed and escrow documents as required to effectuate transfer of the property to county. Thank you very much. This completes our presentation and we are available for questions. Thank you, Agent Finley and Director Morales.
other questions or comments from members of the board? Supervisor Coonerty, sure. Um, so let me just say this is a critical need. I, we hear about it all the time from families in crisis, and I'm so glad you're moving forward uh, with this project. Do you have a sense of the timeline and when we when those beds sort of would be act, come active? So in terms of the timeline that Kimberly presented, uh, we probably are looking at May, hopefully a little sooner. Um, go ahead, Kimberly, and then I'll talk about the programmatic pieces. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, so I do just want to clarify that we would be closing escrow in May, so therefore county would be owner of the property. However, we would still need to go into final design construction <laughs> estimates, return to the board for bids on construction, and then perform construction. I am not uh, managing that project, and so I don't want to overspeak on that timeline. Okay. So for, for us, we would piggyback off of that timeline. Let's just say, you know, it's towards the end of the year, uh, really it's going to take us, uh, we're in the middle of conceptualizing what an RFP would look like for these services. It's two different services. So we have to think about packaging that as you're aware, that takes a few months to do. And also the recruitment of some of the lead staff that would oversee. So my goal is to try to get something by mid uh, 2024, the latest um, based on the infrastructure timeline. Yeah. And that was, so that was the second part of my question, which is the, the physical building, uh, you know, takes time, but but um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but I also know that um, recruiting staff is always a challenge. Um, and um, how do you feel about your ability to appropriately staffed staff these beds so that we can have them available when families need them? Right. One of the the key strategies for us is actually contracting with the vendor for this care, and so that should hopefully help. That you're absolutely right. We still have the challenge of internal staff that, I was, that would oversee the project. Currently, what we're doing is we're leveraging existing expertise in the department to make this work. So we don't have staff right now, but this is a commitment that we have in our department to move forward with this. And I definitely want to see if uh, Tiffany wants has anything else to add on the staffing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have a I have a question, also some comments. My question is, and, and maybe I, I missed this in the report, but does the funding restrict the population that can be served to just children on Medi-Cal, or is it is it available to the broader population of children? It can be available to the broader population of children. We haven't gotten that far in our planning, but there's no restriction on that. Thank you. I mean, as we, as the Criminal Justice Council, some of you involved just completed a, a behavioral health report with frontline law enforcement. I mean, the, the overarching theme that continued to stem from it was this, the lack of beds and the, and the sense of where um, the, the number of diversions that occur because of, of telecare for the adult population, the out-of-county transports for uh, children, and just uh, a general sense of an increase in the number of calls that are coming into um, both health and local law enforcement agencies associated with this without necessarily the resources to address it. So this, this purchase and this conversion has an opportunity to be transformational for uh, the youth in our community to really provide, uh, to A, extricate out of the criminal justice system, children that are really having a health issue and also to supplement the health system to ensure that those resources are provided. And, and a third thing that isn't really discussed for the parents, you know, who really do not know who to turn to in a time of crisis and want to be able to provide um, not just love and support, but the adequate treatment that their children need, but don't know what to do. And uh, so having this facility would really, I think, uh, will, completely change the trajectory for uh, a number of families in our community. Unfortunately, on a need that continues to grow and recognizing that this is just uh, the end of a beginning step and we clearly need to continue to expand in order to meet this growing need in our community. But I appreciate uh, you answering that question about the population that could be served. And I just appreciate the, the overall work that's being done on this. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McFriend. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I would reiterate every comment that's been made. Um, I look forward to uh, acquiring this program that uh, really meets a critical need for uh, our youth and their families and, and their guardians. Uh, I also think it's uh, 
it's significant to note that this is meeting a real key element of our strategic plan that was implemented by our CAO several years ago now. And uh, we put it, we're putting it into place what we said we needed to do and what, what is needed in our community. And to congratulate you for putting together a great grant application program, $24 million doesn't come and go every, every year. Uh, significant way uh, of really serving our community. We all know there's a tremendous need in our community and really throughout this state and nation uh, to address some of these issues of behavioral health, especially with our youth. So I am really happy that we're able to do this and I wanna congratulate each and every one of you. And, and again, for this county, for looking ahead to say, this is really a tremendous need in our community and we put it in our strategic plan and we're gonna meet it. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'll just add that this is clearly, I mean, we've, we've had a lot of discussions about some of the shortcomings of our behavioral health system today. Um, and I think this is gonna be a huge step forward yeah, in the right direction to meet some of those, uh, some of those needs. Chair Koenig, if I could uh, comment. Oh, Wilson, certainly. CEO uh, just wanted to uh, congratulate our staff for moving so quickly on this project. We only became aware of the opportunity a few months ago and they have moved with light speed to get this uh, to the point it is. So I congratulate them on their sense of urgency, which we all know uh, is it's a very important need that we need to meet. The other issue I'd point out is that this is a unique opportunity to acquire an existing building. And so we had originally been talking about building a, a building from scratch, uh, which would cost roughly double. So by taking an existing building, um, and uh, remodeling it, we're saving quite a bit of the public's money. If we were trying to build a, a building from the ground up, we would still be trying to raise funds. So this is a unique opportunity and uh, we do recommend uh, the board of it. Thank you. Thank you, CEO Palacios. Yeah, so it is an incredible opportunity. Uh, I'm excited to support moving forward with it today. And I'll just add, you know, I'm really excited that this is a facility that can be located in mid county, especially given the importance of youth having their friends and family nearby and for, uh, for this facility being accessible. I think it's great that it'll be ultimately right in the middle of the county and as accessible to everyone as possible. Thank you. Is any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. This is an incredible opportunity and I wanna thank staff too for um, doing a great job of getting this grant money for our community. And that I think is a, a real, uh, unfortunately, a real growing need. And I am happy that these youth will be able to stay in this county rather than being shipped to San Jose or Fremont or Napa, even sometimes they are taken. The issue I have with this property is um, the issues that have come to the county taxpayers to repair 5200 SoCal Avenue, which was built at the same time and by the same developer, Barry Swenson Builder, Taxpayers have had to do a lot of uh, building repairs to 5,200. So I hope that um, the 5,300 will be very carefully scrutinized for the issues that have been, that the taxpayers have had to repair in its twin building next door, the Sheriff's Center. Um, there were foundation drainage problems, cracks, water leaking in through the windows. So please take care and make sure we are not saddled with that problem again. I also am worried that there's no public transportation to this area, not at all. And I, I want that uh, fixed. It's going to need to happen with Kaiser Medical Program down the road. Um, I have concerns hearing that it could be managed by a, an outside vendor. I hope it's not telecare. We have had many people who have uh, registered complaints and concerns with you about telecare. So I hope that that is thoroughly vetted and that we have a good staff that will treat our youth and their families with the good care and uh, not prescribe medications. I have a concern about the satellite. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you.
seeing no one else here in chambers. Is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, we do have speakers on Zoom. Caller ending in 1401, your microphone is now available. Uh, this property being adjacent to the sheriff's station is problematic in terms of the satellite that Becky started to address. I've uh, brought this up before. I'm a retired teacher and I was with a group farm without harm. So the first thing with children, the priority is that the environment be a safe and healthy working and living environment, however it is. That's the top priority. So by having this location, and I, telecare also is very uh, problematic. Next to this giant um, radar site, I refer to the September 11, 2022 front page of the Sentinel. What's that giant orb? Radar installation now top Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office rooftop. And uh, a whole article on it. And then it referred you to a book, The Zapping of America by Paul Brodeur, 1977, about the dangers of, of radar. So you are putting, planning to put children to help them, bringing them out of poverty and having full employment for the parents might be the best thing to do, right, in a dangerous location. That's what the evidence is here. And the study of military personnel by radar installation shows health problems. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Mark, your microphone is now available. All right. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Mark Yellen. I'm uh, one of your emergency physicians at Dominican Hospital. I've been there since 1987, and I also serve as medical director for the paramedics in our, in our community. Um, I could take many minutes um, describing what we've been dealing with in the ER and how to deal in the dealing with our um, adolescent and pediatric population and our behavioral health problems. But to keep it short, um, I totally support the endeavors and the planning and the proposals presented here. It will be a huge, huge improvement in our system, something that's extremely needed. And um, I think I could speak for all of the providers in the emergency department at Dominican, and I'll even stretch my neck out and say for Watsonville too, that this is a huge gap in our system that we've been dealing with. And everything that you as a board and our community um, that we can do to support this and to expedite it um, will only be a positive um, point in our system and fill a big gap. There will be problems, I'm sure. There'll be some issues, and there's never going to be a perfect scenario. But this is something that we desperately need, and I encourage you to all uh, vote in favor of this and help move it forward. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yellen. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then I'll return to the board for deliberation and action. I'll move the recommended actions. <laughs> Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Tappet? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you. We will now proceed with item nine, the public hearing to consider adoption of a resolution authorizing the application and adopting the permanent local housing allocation program plan, the permanent local housing allocation program plan. And for a presentation on this item, we have our principal planner, Suzanne Isay. Thank you, Chair Koenig, and good morning, uh, board. Uh, this item uh, is essentially what I consider uh, 
a sort of minor tweak to our existing five-year plan. I can move my slides forward here. Um, for those who are not familiar, the uh, PLHA program, it's the Permanent Local Housing Allocation Program, was created through state legislation in 2017. Um, it was a bill that, uh, Senate Bill 2, that um, did a number of things uh, for affordable housing. And one of the key points of that bill, which you may recall, was to create a new permanent ongoing source of funding to be generated through the state to support uh, localities, cities and counties efforts to support afford affordable housing and provide uh, programs and facilities uh, to address homelessness. So that's where uh, the program comes from. The funding is generated from a fee that is paid when people record certain types of real estate documents with the county recorder. Uh, generally, these are for uh, certain types of property sales, uh, financing of properties and so forth. So the initial uh, amount that was generated in the first several years, um, we we just had estimates from the state as to how much we, we might get in the five-year period. Currently, they now know up to year three of how much we will get, but we still only have sort of placeholder figures for the uh, years four and five. One of the primary motivations for creating this new source was the state's dissolution of redevelopment agencies in 2012. Um, <clears throat> some of you may recall the county had a redevelopment agency and that was the main source of funding that the county had for supporting these types of programs and housing developments. Um, at this point in time, as the state, you know, it's being a very new program, it took them a little while to develop the guidelines and administrative processes for this grant. And we've really just learned over the last year, year and a half, some of the nuances of working with this program. And so one of the nuances that came out more recently is that one of the activities um, that we had chosen with our plan um, required a lot of um, advanced coordination with the state in order for us to even be able to make a commitment, not to spend the funds, but just to give a conditional letter of commitment of funds to an entity, uh, uh, whether it was a housing sponsor of a new um, uh, affordable housing development, or it might be that we wanted to commit funds to, let's say, renovate some existing shelter facility or transitional housing facility, before we could make that commitment, we would have to draft loan documents, uh, deed restrictions, which are, you know, these tend to be voluminous documents, lots of pages, and send it up to the state for their contracts team and their legal team to review it in advance before we could provide such a commitment letter to that entity. Um, that process often can take anywhere from four or five months to more than 12 months in my 20 years of experience of working with this state department. And so we were really concerned about that. Um, we reached out and we attended, you know, technical assistance workshops with the state staff and everything. And they clarified that this is in fact the case, that this is an ongoing requirement. And so we were sort of searching for like, okay, this is, um, problematic because it's a really costly delay. And as you just heard in the prior item, timing is everything. And we need to be re able to respond with lightning speed to opportunities that arise um, with housing developments and state grant funds very often come out of nowhere and you have, you know, five or six weeks to respond. And so having this lengthy delay, um, would eliminate that opportunity for us effectively. And so through our um, research, we learned that there is another comparable activity available in the guidelines for this program, which the end uses of the funds are essentially the same, but without this lengthy delay and state review um, of, of the documents ahead of time, which is that we take the funds and in, instead of just holding them in a new grant account, we deposit them into our existing low moderate income housing fund, which is uh, uh, residual monies from that redevelopment agency we used to have. 
And because that fund is already uh, monitored by the state, we have to do audits every year. We send them the reports on that. Um, I guess they feel comfortable with us once we've deposited those funds into that account. We don't have to do this advanced review process with them of our documents before we can even commit funds to a project. So the change that we're recommending to you today is essentially that we move um, the portion of our, our monies in this plan that had been allocated to what we called activity one, um, which is for affordable housing uses, rental housing primarily, um, and uh, we change it to what they call activity two, which is matching funding for the funds that we have in our existing uh, low and moderate income housing fund. And then we can use them as we would have if they were just ordinary low mod funds that we had had previously. So um, the uh, reason we're coming to you today is primarily because it is the time when we need to submit the application. There's a periodic every so many years we have to reapply for these funds, even though it's a formula that we're we're qualified for a certain amount every year. But every so often they require us to submit a new application and a new resolution. And we're at that point in time where we need to do that for years two and three of this five year period. Um, and so that is why uh, we are requesting adoption of the new resolution. And so our recommended actions are to hold a public hearing on the amended five-year plan, adopt a resolution authorizing the application and the amended PLHA plan, and authorizing the planning director or their designee to submit the amended PLHA five-year plan and application for 2021 and 2022 PLHA grants to the California Department of Housing and Community Development and authorizing the planning director to execute a standard agreement with HCD for the PLHA grants and submit any related documents required to access these grants. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Isai. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is McPherson. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, most welcome news in these times of uh, our housing, housing crisis here and throughout the state. Uh, well, since we've lost uh, redevelopment several years ago, it's been very difficult for us to act promptly. And this this will allow us to speed up the process. Uh, I'm glad we're able to do this, uh, especially when the state is putting very, very uh, heavy um, uh, edicts on us to provide more housing and it's not easy to come by. So this will be, it's going to be a welcome addition to letting us uh, do this in a timely fashion. So I appreciate our um, adjusting to this and I, I highly recommend this. I thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Just real briefly, thank you, for, thank you for this. I'm supportive. Um, you know, I think this is emblematic of the state who is always banging on the table, saying they want more housing, but also making it impossible to build housing uh, through their bureaucracy. So um, we'll adjust and we'll keep adjusting and trying, um, but it would be nice if the state um, would actually make it easy for jurisdictions and affordable housing developers to build housing um, rather than harder at every turn. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. If there's no other questions or comments from board members, is there any member of the public that wishes to speak on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. Thank you, Ms. Issei, for that very clear explanation of this issue. I had read the documentation um, in the staff report, and I appreciate your, your complimentary um, explanation. As referred to by you, supervisors, the, the six cycle RENA numbers are triple what we've had to build in the past. And what I have a question for you, um, Ms. Issei, is um, you, you state that this money would support low and moderate um, housing projects. What about those that include very low? That's the market that we really um, need to support and that often does not get included if if at all, or very marginally in developments that are 
termed affordable housing um, because the developers say it doesn't pencil out. So I would like to see the money um, focused on building and making um, the very low income people um, to, to have a place for rental market housing. Uh, rental low-income housing. I also want to ask if this grant money can be used to support alternative housing lifestyles, such as um, pallet shelter communities. Um, the board has recently passed a tiny home on wheels ordinance that would allow tiny home on wheels to be deemed primary residences. Um, if we had something in uh, some land the county was able to get or maybe already owned, such as um, on the Freedom Campus in Watsonville, um, we could put up something there and use this money for that if if that is agreeable to the terms of this new activity that the money could be spent on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. See anyone else here in chambers? Is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Call in user ending in 1401. Your microphone is now available. The very low income people are not provided for. I think affordable housing title is a misnomer. Affordable to whom? And we have the very poor because we have the very rich. This looks like a drop in the bucket to me at a time where more people have been driven out of their homes and forced unemployment during these last two years. It's increased. I think we have an economic structural problem and I have mentioned this in previous meetings, a real insight to me when I got to visit the former Soviet Union in 1966, a relative in Moscow at that time, they had affordable housing. My relative paid about 5% of her income for rent, and it was a small but pleasant housing with parks surrounding the area. This is um, a myth of remedying a problem that's a structural problem. We need a system change that provides for everybody that doesn't make more people homeless and give all our tax money to the military while people here are hungry and unhoused. That's my comments. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. Move the recommended action. Second. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? And Koenig? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Isai. All right, we will now proceed with item 10, which is to consider a selection of one nominee for appointment to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board of Directors as an at-large general committee member representative from the nominations of Daniel Dodge, Jack B. Brown Jr. and Michael Rotkin and approve final appointment of the selected nominee to Metro Board of Directors for a term to expire December 31st, 2026. A little further in the way of introductions, uh, on this item, the Board of Supervisors gets three public appointments to the Santa Cruz Metro Board. The terms are four years long each. The term for one of those appointments expires December 31st of this year, and we are considering three nominations for that one seat. The two other appointments do not expire until December 2024 and December 2025, respectively, and are not under consideration today. I'll also add that this appointment to the Metro Board is significant. Metro has a big role to play in the way people in our community get around, and it will need to play an even bigger role in the year to come if we're going to meet our climate action goals and our housing goals. Both Supervisor McPherson and I presently sit on the Metro board, and I can tell you that uh, we're at a really pivotal time for Metro. 
beginning of 2023, we're going to break ground on the Highway 1 Bus on Shoulder Auxiliary Lane project, as well as the SoCal Drive Multimodal project. And both of these projects will create significant infrastructure enhancements for Metro and create opportunities for improved service. However, improving service in one area could mean cutting services somewhere else. So it'll be difficult decisions ahead. Additionally, Metro will need to transition to purchasing all zero emissions buses by 2040 and replacing more than half its fleet ahead of that time. And finally, the agency, like all transit agencies in America today, are is facing challenges as we grapple with the end of COVID funding and new commuter reality. So of our three nominees, I see that uh, we do have two here in the audience and I'll uh, let them uh, speak here in a moment. Um, so first we have Mike Rotkin, who has served as one of our appointments to Metro for eight years, two consecutive terms. And he's been nominated to serve a third term by Supervisor McPherson and Coonerty. And, uh, you know, I felt that with any uh, and, and then with any uh, election, uh, so with any appointment, that it's good to have some competition. Um, and so I have also nominated Jack Brown, who I think would be a dramatic leap forward in technological know-how. Uh, and uh, also Daniel Dodge, who'd be, uh, would uh, be a representative from South County. As I said, we um, on the board, we get three public representatives. And today, two are from North County and one is from Mid County. Um, and so it struck me that we should certainly at least consider someone from South County. Uh, now, I'd like to invite Michael Rodkin up to the mic to speak. Thank you, Chair Koenig and board members. Um, I sent you an email responding to what I will charitably describe as um, misleading information about my support of unions. Uh, I want to thank you for the nomination, and I just I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. I'll return to my seat, but at some point you uh, have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you very much again for the nomination. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. And next, I'll invite up Daniel Dodge. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Board of Supervisors, brothers, sisters, siblings. Um, first of all, um, I'm Daniel Dodge, Sr. Just taught a little clarification for somebody else that holds Electus office in this county. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Supervisor Caput for all the years of service to our community and uh, wish him the best in um, all the endeavors that he takes on in the future. Um, my name is Daniel Dodge Sr. I'm a former mayor, former city council member. I've chaired three commissions here for the county, LAFCO, Santa Cruz Metro previously, and uh, Latino Affairs Commission. Um, the Metro Board, um, I, was, I served previously as an elected official, as I mentioned, in the, in the role of chair. Um, I've been very active in working with the ADA community was on, when I was on the board. I received a, the Kudos Award, actually, from uh, Supervisor Coonerty at that particular time, um, many, many years ago. Um, I'm very interested in uh, representing uh, my community, the Pajaro Valley, um, the city of Watsonville. Um, recently, um, we've had some cuts to uh, the lifeline of our area and um, 69 and the 71, the express buses. I certainly believe that Metro uh, allows the, the opportunity for people in my community to have access to health care, employment, education, and we want to be able to make sure that those, uh, when we talk about equity, we want to be sure that we have the uh, provision of equity of services to South County. Um, I have an extensive record in the community, um, public service. Um, and these days I might retire, but currently that's not on my list of things to do. I'd be happy to serve in this role. Um, I'm here to take any questions that you might have of me, and uh, thank you for accepting my application and, and moving it forward. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel Dodge Sr. All right, at this time, uh, I don't believe Jack Brown is with us today, unless uh, he's online. I don't think so. Right. Not believe and any so questions so. or comments from members of the board? No. Supervisor Caput? You bet. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, all th uh, three are well qualified and everything. Uh, but I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Mike for uh, 12 years. And uh, uh, 
I don't know why, but I like you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I consider you a friend and I appreciate all the work you've put in. So, um, uh, like I said, I'm sure all the others are qualified, but uh, I like Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Or sorry, uh, Supervisor Caput, Supervisor Kennedy. Uh, uh, sure. So I just um, I just want to make a, a comment. Um, so I have a long relationship uh, with uh, Mr. Dodge, and I appreciate everything he's done for this community. I appreciate the voices, uh, the smart uh, folks who I assume we'll hear from shortly. Um, uh, the reason I nominated Mike Rockin, um, three reasons. Uh, one is uh, I think he's done an excellent job of um, serving our community in this role for many years. Um, the second uh, piece is that um, the public members, uh, it's my understanding, one's from Aptos, and one's from Happy Valley. And so we don't have a representative from Santa Cruz where there's a majority of the writers are. There's also the Metro project, which will be coming online and significant budget, budget impacts. And so from my perspective, it's incredibly important to have that, that voice uh, on the board. And then finally, um, I, I got to say, uh, Mike Rockin has been my uh, union representative for 18 years, um, fighting for better wages for not only everyone in my union, but uh, across uh, different unions. Um, and he's been a real labor advocate. Um, I think we need to be in a place where um, people can disagree, people can have different opinions, um, and we don't have uh, bright lines on every issue and can appreciate and put into context his whole career where um, I felt incredibly represented as a, as a union member, dues paying union member uh, for 18 years by Mike Rockin and um, and I appreciate everything he's done. So um, uh, it's a uh I appreciate people coming forward and being willing to serve on this role. I think it's critical that we have somebody from the third district representing us uh, in, in one of these public seats. Um, and I appreciate everything Mike's done uh, for this board and for our community over the years. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah, I I, love, McPherson. I just appreciate uh, this. I appreciate those the three who have applied for this. Uh, I, um, I I'd like to hear public testimony first, but would be uh, willing and able to make the uh, 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 recommended uh, action when it comes for the appointment. All right, thank you, Supervisor McPherson. All right, I will open it for public comment. Morning, Supervisors. Um, my name is James Sandoval. I am the chairman of Smart Local 23, who represents the bus and par uh, paratransit drivers at Santa Cruz Metro. And we come to you with the concern of the possible reappointment of Mike Rockin. This is nothing personal. It's strictly business. Um, we've had a few issues with Mike Rockin in the past and as recently as this year, where our union proposed legislation to improve labor relations at Santa Cruz Metro, as in SB 957. It came at no cost, but it was a tool for our toolbox to get through times where we couldn't come to an agreement. And we thought Mike Rockin would be the first one to support us, support us on that, and uh, he actually came out strongly opposing it. Um, it did not make sense for us for anybody to not support it since it came at no uh, cost. And we did have a lot of times where we came to no uh, agreement with the previous CEO. And um, we also, um, you know, despite a strong uh, objection to it, we did get support on our board of directors to move that legislation forward, including getting it through our assembly Senate and eventually signed by the governor. Um, uh, but this is more than just about our concerns with Mike Rock, and it's about making sure we have a voice for Watsonville. We have three at-large members on our um, board and out of 11, and um, one represents Mid-County. One is a former TAPS director for UCSC, so that is the Santa Cruz voice, and the other one is Mike Rockin. Uh, Daniel Dodge would bring us the voice for Watsonville, and with Watsonville representing about half the population in our county, it's only fair to them to give them another voice on our seat, on our, our, our board of directors that we, where they only have two seats. Uh, we should give them at least three. And so, um, like I said, nothing personal against Mike, but uh, we do need uh, more representation for our Watsonville folks. And um, as for everybody to stand with me today, that 
you know, supports the same concern. And as you can see, uh, there was 160 emails that were sent to you all with the same concerns as well. This is not just our union. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandoval. Good, good morning, Chair Koenig and uh, members of the board. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. I'm a resident of the city of Santa Cruz, a uh, former employee of the uh, Public Works Department here at the county, uh, still an active uh, SEIU member, and I am the Vice President of the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. What's before you today is an appointment of a public uh, representative on the Metro Board. And uh, what that means is uh, somebody to rep represent the general population and as I'm sure you're aware, uh, most people in Santa Cruz County um, are working for a living and therefore they're working people. And uh, as I'm sure you're also aware, labor unions are the uh, strongest and most consistent voice uh, in um, as advocates of all working people, not just members of uh, of their own unions. Um, if anyone has uh, been uh, traveling on uh, highways, uh, Highway 1 between uh, Santa Cruz and uh, Watsonville lately, you'll know that uh, there, they, there's a lot of people moving from Watsonville who live in the South County and coming to Santa Cruz. And it's very important that those people have a voice and uh, so on account of those two points, uh, I, I know two of the um, nominees and uh, personally, and I recommend uh, your uh, appointing uh, Daniel Dodge Sr. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, members of the Board of Supervisors, staff, and the community. My name is Nahara Villalobos. I am a Baltimore resident, a Cabrillo alumni, and a San Jose State student. I'm asking you to please appoint Mr. Daniel Dodge Sr. for the following reasons I'm about to state. Number one, Mr. Dodge is a Baltimore resident and he will be giving the South County voice that we all need. Number two, if it wasn't for his influence, telling me how to go to school, come back and use the bus, because if you don't know, the 91X is the fastest route to go to Cabrillo College to and from to Watsonville. Mr. Dodge has been an advocate for the ADA community that have acknowledged him, his efforts in ADA issues, especially from Felipe de Leon that no longer is here. And my sister, Miriam Villalobos, have recognized him and given him a kudos award in 2016. He is the voice of change. He is a people, people of the people. And who else could do this job as he's done this before? Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Naraha. Hi, good morning. My name is Bonnie Moore. I'd like to thank um, Supervisor Caput for his time on his service here on the Board of Supervisors and Ryan Coonerty as well. Thank you for all your service. Really appreciate it. And I kind of look forward to more democratic kind of eye-opening speakers that you've been able to bring to town. So thank you for that. Um, I'm also here to speak about the issues of the appointments that you're looking at today. Um, one of the things in your own appointment direction is somebody at large, a person at large, or somebody, a community member, somebody that rides the bus, maybe somebody that has knowledge or de is dependent on the bus. That's not what you have here today. Um, you have repeat political positions that are people that are coming back for additional appointments onto different commissions. Um, I'm going to, you know, uh, Michael, you know, we go back a lot of years and I'm not here to argue with history, facts or anything along those lines, but supportive towards labor has not been his best suit in our area, in our arena at the transit system. The fact that, you know, he does not ride the bus. He does. He's not that familiar with the bus system. He sat there 
for a number of years as a political position, and he sits there currently today at the same thing. There are people in our community that deserve the ability to sit on that commission and take a look at the public transit system to see what works for our community. We're going into times now where um, in the environment is huge. Our system has been shrinking and that is not okay. What we're doing today and looking at this appointment, it does not work. His alignment with labor outside of the university is not as good as you think. His alignment with the transportation system has not been that supportive. And we need to have somebody there that really rides the bus and understands the system and is dependent on it. You don't have anyone there that does that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mark. Good morning, my name is Brandon Freeman. I'm the senior vice chair for Smart Local 23 at Santa Cruz Metro. Um, first, Mike, thank you for your many, many years of service on the board. We don't wanna trivialize any of those things that you have done to help us out. However, my main concern is the coming service changes that we have coming up. As most of you know, we have an operational analysis coming up at Metro. One of my primary tasks with the union will be to represent our side in that. Um, thus far, making changes to routings, to schedulings, it's been extremely difficult to get any kind of representation out of Watsonville. Uh, Ari has helped when she can, and Jimmy is extremely busy, but tries to make time. Um, today, I'm asking you to appoint Daniel Dodge so that we have a more well-rounded and better feedback system for all areas of our county as we go into the operational analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Hi, my name is Veronica Hamilton. I'm a graduate student at UCSC, um, and I was the chair of my union during our five-month wildcat strike three years ago. And as you likely know, we are one month into another strike up at campus. I'm here to speak against the reappointment of Mike Rotkin. Uh, Mike has been antagonistic against labor, and metro workers are incredibly important to the broader labor community in Santa Cruz. Um, I would I would argue at least at this time that he is not supportive of labor on our campus. I've seen that with my own union. Uh, graduate students are in strong support of Metro drivers. We know that the reappointment of anti-labor Mike, Rock, Mike Rotkin will go against our shared goals of labor peace. As Metro goes into contract negotiations, it's important that you know that if Metro workers have problems, that we're all gonna have problems. If you want labor peace, do not reappoint Mike Rotkin. I know you have a lot of projects going on this year. You certainly don't want another issue. Labor supports Daniel Dodge. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Luna. I'm an academic researcher at the University of California, Santa Cruz uh, with local UAW 5810. Um, the Metro workers have always been there to support the two strikes that I've been a part of in the seven years I've been here and always standing with us, making sure they're not crossing the picket line and showing solidarity. That's why I'm here today in, in solidarity with Metro workers and other unions uh, locally that are urging you to please appoint Daniel Dodge to the board, the Metro board. Um, despite claims to be supporting labor, unfortunately, Mike Rotkin's record has not supported that claim. Um, both with uh, SB 957, uh, opposing that legislation to support Metro workers, as well as uh, opposing our strike that is going on currently with UAW at the university. Um, I urge you not to vote for your friends or people that you may know with historically, but instead to vote for higher representation from people from South County who are all here um, to urge you to, to do the same. Um, so please stand with us in supporting working people and labor by appointing Daniel Dodge. Thank you. Thank you, Luna. Um, hi, my name is uh, Nate Abrego. I am a, a longtime uh, South County resident um, and longtime user of the bus uh, in my teen years. And, and eight years into my uh, work with uh, um, Santa Cruz Metro. Um, I'm a paratransit operator and have done that for 14 years now. Um, I, 
I urge you to appoint uh, uh, someone who can properly, who can bring more voice and equity to to uh, our entire county. Uh, South County uh, um, has, I've noticed lacking um, uh, uh, transportation options. Um, it, it, it's it's slowly been dwindling down, and and in this uh, pivotal time that we're going into, where restructuring is definitely on the horizon for the Santa Cruz Metro, it is imperative that South County has proper representation, and and I assure you, Santa Cruz will have their voice. South County needs their voice too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Borrego. Uh, hey, how's it going? My name is Nate Edenhofer. I'm a, a graduate student and a teaching assistant up at the university and a member of UAW 2865. Um, and I just want to, uh, yeah, again, uh, echo everyone here saying uh, no to Rodkin and yes to Daniel Dodge. Um, Rodkin opposed SB 957, with, uh, so it opposing the rights of uh, uh, the Metro workers, right, to have the same uh, rights as public employees as other public employees. He's also been unsupportive of us and our current strike on the campus, um, our current ULP protected strike. Um, so he has not been pro-labor. Um, I think it's also important to have a voice from South County, um, which is another important reason uh, that we support Daniel Dodge. And, uh, you know, if we care about public transit, we need to care about the workers driving it because there is no public transit without the workers driving it. And that's why labor supports Daniel Dodge Sr. Thank you, Mr. Eatonhofer. Hello, my name is Monica. Thank you for your service. I'm a community member. I'm here to support Daniel Dodge Jr. He has continuously stood up for working families, not only in Watsonville, but also in Santa Cruz County. Um, he has a great understanding of South Santa Cruz County and he knows the residents' needs, and we need a lot of help there, and I would appreciate your support in electing Daniel Dodge Sr. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone? Uh, sure. Thank you for this opportunity. I'll be very brief. I just want to correct some misinformation. I support the graduate student strike. I walked on the picket line, signed the petition, um, canceled my class, instructed other lecturers on how they might meet their legal obligations to like provide education for their students, but without crossing the picket line. So I don't understand where that's coming from. I am a bus rider. I don't ride it regularly, but I ride it more than any other member of the board, as far as I'm aware. Um, and um, so I'm somewhat baffled, frankly, at this charge that I'm anti-union. I just don't get it. I just want to provide that information for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodkin. Mr. Dodge. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just in a, I want to take a moment to thank everybody that's spoken um, on my behalf. Um, but it's not just my behalf. I, I've been able to. Uh, um, I'm a former bus rider. I, well, I haven't ridden it since in a couple of weeks, but I used to have to ride it for my everyday life back in 70, when back in the, in the seventies, when we first started the transportation system in this County, um, the, the 71 was the lifeblood, which is the lifeblood of the County. Um, I, I frequently, it took me to all those things to be able to, um, better my life. And, uh, so I have a, I just want to say that as a passion because what we're talking about here at times is a South County representation. And if we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, which are the buzzwords that we hear all the, the current time, um, I want to be able to speak on the path, on the behalf of the Pajaro residents of the Valley of, of Pajaro. So I, I think that I wanted to be able to echo that because I didn't want to get it lost, lost in some of the discussion. So we're talking about, South County representation. Um, I, I live there. I live it. I, I'm part of the people that live there. I'm happy that people stood up for me today. Um, I didn't necessarily ask them to. So I just, uh, it, it makes me happy that we're in this chambers, that we're in this chambers. Um, 
board, here at the Board of Supervisors. It took a lot of hard work for, um, for us to be able to, to have a voice here in the county, and we're still working on that. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, considering my application. And uh, really, I want to be able to help the, the Metro Board grow into what it's going to become in the next couple of years. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel Dodge Sr. Is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers on Zoom. Brian, your microphone is now available. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples from Trail Now. We're a local advocacy group trying to build the coastal trail. Uh, myself, I've been personally involved in Santa Cruz Transportation for over 20 years, actively engaged with the Regional Transportation Commission for over 10. I actually wrote a California Assembly bill that would divert tax dollars to public transit. So I'm a big advocate of transit. Um, I've actually participated, and a lot of people don't know this, um, that Mr. Rodkin actually has voted against Metro at the Regional Transportation Commissions in the way of funding going towards them versus other alternatives. He, uh, he has an ad, uh, ideology that, uh, that really directs him away from Metro and funding Metro buses. What I've observed over the decade that I've been participating on the transportation board. Um, at the end of the day, um, I think uh, you should step back and understand that Mr. Rotkin brings a lot of controversy. Uh, he did, you know, I'm sure some good work, but he brings a lot of controversy. And I think our community, after we saw Measure D and all of the uh, issues with the elections and the and the the general controversy that we have with transportation, I think it it would be a step forward for our community if do we shifted gears and we chose not to reelect Mr. Rotkin. Our community really needs to um, mend and be better focused on imp improved communications and working together. And I think it's obvious that Mr. Rotkin brings controversy. Um, and I don't think we need to continue that. We need to move forward and uh, Mr. Daniel seems like a, a very good advocate for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. How many more folks do we have online? We have nine more speakers, Chair. All right. I would just ask, uh, since a lot has been said um, already, and we are running a little bit over for both the 1045 item and ultimately 11 o'clock item, that uh, we just ask public speakers to please uh, keep their comments succinct. And if you agree with any comments made by four uh, previous speakers, just to I uh, mentioned that you agree with us. Thank you. Matt, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Um, uh, Supervisors McPherson and, and um, Coonerty for bringing forward Mike, no Mike Rockin's nomination for reappointment to the um, community representative position on the Metro Transit Board. I'm speaking today as a representative for Friends of the Rail and Trail, and we encourage you to reappoint Mike. We think that he brings a long-term historic understanding of transportation issues in the county and in the trans transit district. And this, this background will be coming in critical in the coming years. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Cesar, your microphone is now available. Yeah, good uh, morning, everybody. Cesar Lara with the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. We're uh, 80 unions, 37,000 union members, and you know, I'm, I want to come to you today to talk about the importance of representation in, in South County. Um, many speakers have have already talked about uh, why they don't feel that Mike Rockins is the right appointment, and, and I want to echo those, but not repeat them in respect of time, but do want to uh, talk about the importance of representation for working families and needing somebody in South Santa Cruz County as, as, as a voice. Uh, transportation agencies across the United States and including ours 
are in flux and 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 really trying to um, morph to the new normal. And we need somebody that a you know could clearly work with unions. You know, uh, both SEIU and Smart uh, unions are supporting uh, Danny Dodge uh, Senior and and his appointment to this board along with all of our other labor unions and we feel that it's important uh and to have a voice that a is experienced as as he's been on the board before but b that you know has the positive relationship um as you could see from our labor community we 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 clearly just you know don't see mike rockins as as a voice for working families and and labor and you know with all the years of of being on the board, I think it's time to for him to move aside and appoint somebody from South County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lara. Liam, your microphone is now available. Thank you, board. Um, my name is Liam McLaughlin. I'm a political organizer with SEIU 521 uh, here in uh, Santa Cruz, Salinas, um, and Watsonville. And um, I'm, I'm here in solidarity with UAW. I'm here in solidarity with SMART, um, as well as our own um, employees in Metro. We, uh, you know, are strong in solidarity. Uh, labor is is strong and united right now. We're speaking up for the working class. Public transportation, uh, this whole system, uh, benefits first and foremost the working class. Uh, so, so we strongly uh, feel that we want someone who. Uh, whose heart lies uh, with those people uh, who are working, who are, who are traveling from Watsonville for work. Um, so we strongly support uh, Daniel Dodge Sr. And we strongly oppose Mike Rotkin. Um, he mentioned he wasn't sure why Labor is speaking out against him, but I think it's pretty clear. Uh, he did not support SMART with their sensible legislation earlier uh, last year or this year. He did not support SEIU county workers. He did not support SEIU city workers. Um, so uh, that's no surprise to me that, that we're speaking out against him uh, and in favor of someone who really does care about the working class. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Brenda, your microphone's now available. <clears throat> okay. Hello, everybody. So I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Brenda Garcia. I've lived in Santa Cruz since I was seven years old. I'm 26 years now. I used the bus to go to elementary school, high school, um, colleges, um, sorry, classes at Cabrillo. Then I used it for work. So I've been using the bus for a long time and the well-being of the workers there is very important to me. Um, I'm a new person here, so I normally don't come to these meetings. I was just told about it, so I'm kind of like an outsider here. And I really liked what I've heard about Daniel Dodge so far because I'm Latina. Um, I organized the union in my workplace, and I know that there can be no equity of services without labor power. So it's really important for me to hear all these um, statements from all these people who are involved in their union. Um, and so because I'm new here, I do want to say to the white men on the board, um, I just want to reread some of what y'all said in the beginning that kind of caught me off guard. You said, I don't know why, but I like him about Mike. And then you said, I felt incredibly represented as a union member without acknowledging that you're a white man. And so I just want to kind of reread this out loud to y'all so you kind of get that like what you say might not come off right to other people, um, especially if they're, you know, people of color who are wanting representation in leadership. Um, this is not a boys club. Um, and I just really want to like let that be known and just think about the people that you're serving, like me, who've lived in Santa Cruz for so long and use the services here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Jordan, your microphone is now available. Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Vasconis, and I'm a Santa Cruz Metro employee and also represent Metro workers serving as their SEA chapter president in SEIU Local 521. In my time serving in this position, I've witnessed Mike collude against Metro workers and other anti-labor board members. He excused bad behavior from the previous CEO, Alex Clifford, and did anything and everything to prop him up while over 90% of Metro employees expressed discontent via a vote of no confidence. Mike, you do not stand in solidarity with Metro or UCSC workers. The labor movement is no longer yours to co-op, so please stop the charades here. 
Um, Mike does not ho currently hold any democratically elected positions and we should elect someone to the Metro board who serves the public through democracy and not nepotism. The public of Santa Cruz deserves a higher standard of representation for bus service, especially in South County. And unfortunately, Mike Rockin does not provide this. Um, I'm also Bruce McPherson's constituent as well, and I'm urging him to stop promoting old guard politicians here in Santa Cruz. The public of Santa Cruz County, especially young people and those of lower socioeconomic status have had enough of this and deserve more fair representation. We wish to see the appointment of Daniel Dodge Sr. on this board seat instead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vasconis. Jared, your microphone is now available. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jared Pettit. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz and a member of UAW 2865. I'm here in support of my comrades who work for Santa Cruz Metro and in support of the appointment of Daniel Dodge Sr. Organized labor rejects the anti-labor reappointment of Mike, Rock Mike Rotkin on the Santa Cruz Metro board. Mr. Rotkin acts baffled about his opposition, but doesn't address his own opposition to things like SB 957, which would have recognized the rights of Metro workers. I urge you to support working people um, and the residents of South County by appointing Daniel Dodd Sr. to the Metro board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petta. Call in user ending in 1401. Your microphone is now available. I rode the bus for many, many years, and I am in support of labor. Without the bus drivers, everything would fall apart, and it's clear who labor supports for this nomination. I also am interested in a response from Daniel Dodge on his work with the Americans with Disability at a Community. I have also attended, before the lockdown, meetings of the Metro Board with the issue of ADA and that the bus using all this wireless microwave technology is a violation of ADA because of the adverse health effects that have to thank, do thank with you, chronic Garrett. fatigue uh, and a If you have anything else to say about the appointment, we'd appreciate it. But, uh, I would like to see someone on the board who is going to remove this harm of the wireless microwave technology, so-called smart. It isn't smart at all. It's harmful. And I do not ride the bus since I had cataract surgery. I drive, but I would not want to get on the bus because of the toxicity of the radiation. I would like to see this issue addressed where the radiation harm from wireless is removed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carrot. Barry, your microphone is now available. Uh, thank you, and uh, my name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos, and I uh, I don't envy you your your uh, your situation and in, in having to make a decision. I I want to say I I support Mike Rock, and I think he's been um, a, a very effective uh, leader both on the on the RTC matters and Metro. I at the same time I'm a huge supporter of all things South County and unions. I've been a member of the union. I, I strongly support unions, and I and I see no, nothing uh, unfavorable about Mr. Dodge. Uh, I wish we could appoint both. At this time, however, I think we need to keep Mike on the board. And I would love to see at the next opportunity to add a member that we consider Daniel Dodge. Uh, Mike, uh, among other reasons uh, to keep Mike uh, in this seat is the fact that we have defeated Measure D, 
and made the determination to move forward with rail transit, which is likely to be integrated with Metro services. So we, we need someone that has the background and the experience and the kind of the institutional knowledge of all the decisions that have been made by both Metro and the Regional Transportation Commission. And, and we need to preserve that continuity. I would love to have Daniel Dodge become a, 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 a more active participant in these matters. Uh, but uh, for this appointment today, Please, uh, please uh, permit uh, Mike Rotkin to continue in his role. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Michael, your microphone's now available. This is Jean Brocklebank using Michael's computer. A fresh face on any public body is always a fine idea. I want someone who wants a strong, efficient, bus system on the Metro board. My husband and I rarely use the bus right now because as everybody knows, we walk everywhere, but I'm looking forward to using Metro when we can no longer walk. I know Jack Brown would do well in this position because I know him and I know his engineering um, uh, capabilities. Uh, that said, what I've heard today from Daniel Dodge Sr. Uh, has impressed me greatly. And I think he would be a fine, new, fresh face on the Metro board. I hope this board, the Board of Supervisors, will vote to approve the appointment of Daniel Dodge Sr. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brocklebank. Emily, your microphone is now available. Hello, uh, my name is Emily Robertson. Um, and I would just like to echo my support for the appointment of Daniel Dodge Sr., um, along with other community members and workers from the county. Uh, I think better representation for South County would be great and a fresh face on the board as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. JS, your microphone is now available. Hi, my name is Josh Stevens. I was wanting to advocate for the election of either Mike Rockin or Daniel, but I'd prefer Daniel because of the fact that you look at the streets of the place he represents and they do not have the safest public transportation infrastructure. You look at the streets to cross, you look at the bus stops that aren't being as well taken care of and you compare the South County region to North County, or let alone just the city of Santa Cruz. And it's just a whole different world. Quoting the uh, words of an executive director of a transportation nonprofit, the West Side rules Santa Cruz. And with that said, I believe that we need someone who represents the county at large and not the city that pretends to always be in charge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. Then I'll return to the board for deliberation and action. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna be supporting Mike Rotkin. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all of the three applicants. Uh, Metro is a very vital service, as we all know, to in Santa Cruz County. Um, I, I'm, I'm really taken aback and surprised at some of the statements that have been made. Uh, some of them, I believe, are unfounded. And, uh, you know, some, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that the, the bill that everybody refers to is a split vote on Metro as well. So it doesn't sound, it makes it sound like Mike brought their loan to, spoke, to speak against it. Um, but he has decades of experience, and uh, I have not always agreed with Mike Rotkin. So this is not something that uh, I'm, I'm recommending the appointment of Mike Rotkin because he's always agreed with me, not by a long shot. But I respect his uh, input and what he has. He's uh, an expert at metro operations, um, and he understands thoroughly the issues and much added services are being added to uh, the Watsonville area as I speak. Um, and I think those operations include some of the labor issues that were discussed. So most importantly, though, he has decades of uh, institutional experience that's uh, very much appreciated, uh, reviewing transportation policies and the projects, and has a deep understanding of the mm -hmm. complex elements involved. Um, 
I've, um, like I said, I have not always agreed with Mike Rotkin and won't tomorrow either, probably, but I do respect his input. Uh, what I really appreciate is that when he makes a point, he has some facts and figures about it that uh, to support his viewpoint. He's always been upstanding in that respect. And uh, like I said, I don't always agree with him, but I do respect him. So I would like to make the nomination for Mike Rotkin to be the at-large representative on my metro. I'll second that. All right, motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Supervisor Friend? Yes, I want to make a, a, a few comments. First, because I think that it's important to recognize what the at-large positions are for. There's an, It's an 11-member uh, metro. Currently, five of the members are from North County, four are from Mid County, and two are from the area south of Rio de Mar Boulevard. So there's a significant lack of representation in the South County, including actually even from this board. I mean, our, our two board representatives, I'm not saying that, that they don't raise a voice for uh, South County, but the point, when you go back to the original bylaws and the creation of the Metro, the point for the at-large memberships was to have a geographic diversity, which doesn't currently exist on the membership. Um, I got to I gotta defend uh, Mr. Rock. The, the things that were said about Mr. Rock have not been my personal experience. I understand uh, the caller talking about um, the need for uh, diversity on the board. And I, believe me, you'll, you'll understand why I'm in support of that in a second. But I've worked with uh, with Mr. Rockin on a number of issues across the county, and he's been one of the strongest voices in, in every experience I've had. And, and by the way, in a lot of closed sessions that aren't, uh, obviously we can't have uh, discussions about what are said in there, but he's one of the strongest voices I've, I've seen on a number of boards I've been on on behalf of labor. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, defend Mike's name in that regard, because I feel like uh, he's been maligned in a sense that people don't want him to be on the board, but I think that we're sort of misrepresenting his positions as a result of that. With that said, um, I, I'm going to put forward a counter nomination because I think that the actual point of the at-large positions is to have geographic equity, which does not exist. So I'm going to put forward a counter nomination for Daniel Dodge Sr. Um, just because of the numbers that I, I put forward. I mean, you can't have nine of the 11 members to be functionally north of 41st Avenue or west of 41st Avenue and feel that we have geographic diversity or representation on the board. I understand uh, Supervisor Coonerty's point about uh, he he had made a comment that the majority of of riders are are from the city of Santa Cruz. Technically, the largest number of riders are for the university buses specifically, but they come from different locations throughout the county. The number two most road uh, used bus is the seventy one, which comes from from Watsonville and can, and gets you know connected into places up in the university and other places. So I think that. I mean, look, th this board has done a lot toward equity in the last couple of years from investments in the Papua River, the, the healthcare project, the new South County Service Center. We also have to recognize a lot of people live in Watsonville because we don't have a lot of affordable housing for people to live anywhere else. A lot of people that rely on the bus from an uh, economic standpoint live in South County. And so there should just be an additional South County voice, whether it's Mr. Dodger. I mean, it's not even an, a necessarily an, a... Uh, endorsement on Mr. Dodge as much as it is on that, that voice needs to be elevated from South County. Um, so with that, I'm putting forward a counter nomination for uh, Mr. Dodge. I mean, I can count the votes and already figure out that they're not there, but I think it's important that we have this discussion to say that there should be South County representation, that we got to do better than the current board makeup as it is. I mean, this, this nine to two is not really representing South County. I mean, by any sort of a uh, strategy, whether that means we have a different discussion on this board about moving forward about who the two county supervisors that are representing the Metro board, maybe that could also happen. But at a minimum, we should work on this geographic equity with the at-large positions that we have, and we're currently not meeting that moment. So I'll put forward a counter nomination of Daniel Dodge Sr. if there's a second for that. I'll, I'll second, um, because I do feel that um, you know, while I also like Mike um, and I've enjoyed working with him, and I think he always brings a, a lot of uh, dedication and information to every everything that we discuss. Um, I think that just fundamentally, you know, we can't have reports that like a Santa Cruz like me that talk about uh, the lack of representation from um, you know from South County and from uh, from youth and from our Latino population, uh, and then go and have uh, you know three white members on uh, our of our three appointments for um, the Metro board. 
Um, I do think that North County is well represented today with Larry Pegler, who, um, while a first district resident, um, was also the former director of the transportation and parking program at UCSC, and so is a strong voice um, for for that institution and for North County. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's why I'll be supporting Mr. Dodge. So I think we would treat that as a substitute motion um, and take a vote on that first. All right. There's... Yeah, I'll just state for the record that under Rosenberg's rules, the last motion is is taken first. Right. The last motion in order. Okay. So, any further discussion? All right. Uh, so, so, just to clarify, just to clarify, this is a vote on Daniel Dodge Senior's nomination for Metro. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. No. Caput. This is for uh, Daniel Dodge Senior. We're voting on Dodge. I, I thought we had a motion for Rodkin first. Huh? It's a substitute motion. It's taken first. Okay. Uh, no. Supervisor McPherson? No. And Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Motion fails three to two. All right. I will now proceed with the nomination of uh, Mike Rodkin. And so, clerk, if you could call the roll on that. Supervisor Friend. It's strange to vote against you, Mike, but no. <laughs> Coonerty? Aye. Abbott? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? No. Motion passes three to two. All right. Do Mike, have Mike to Rodkin do? is our new nomination. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we will now, um, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but we do have a scheduled item for 1045 AM before we proceed uh, with the issuance of proclamations, um, item 13. So we'll now proceed with item 12, which is the Board of Supervisors for Recess. Uh, so the Board of Vectors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District of Zone 5 can meet. Uh, and I'll hand, is it, is it me? All right. Uh, we, we do mix these up a little bit. So then, um, I'll give a moment for Rachel Fatui to join us. Welcome. All right. For those uh, directors joining online, if you'd like to turn your cameras on, we'll go ahead and get you on screen. Thank you. All right. I will now call to order the uh, regular meeting of the uh, Board of Directors of the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5. Could you please call the roll? Director Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Chappett? Here. McPherson? Here. Jaffa? Brown? Here. And Chair Koenig? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum, Chair. Thank you. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agendas today? Thank you. And uh, just check your mic, make sure that's on, that you got the green light there at the base. All right. Are there any oral communications for the Flood Control District. Any members of the board? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll proceed with item four, approval of zone five meeting minutes. Any comments or questions from board members? Approve approval. Uh, if there's public comment. All right, if there's no public comment, is there any public comment on the minutes? Anyone online? We have no speakers online. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Second. Coonerty, second by Supervisor Friend to approve the minutes. If there's no further discussion, we'll call vote, please. Director Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Brown? I'll abstain as I wasn't present at the last meeting. And Koenig? Aye. All right. Thank you. We'll now proceed with item five, action on the consent agenda. This is items six through nine. Any comments or questions for board members on the consent agenda? Any member of the public that wishes to speak on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, is there a motion? I'll move the recommended action. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty to adopt the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Director Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Brown. Aye. And Koenig. Aye. And it passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, District Engineer Fatui. That concludes uh, our regular meeting of the Zone 5 District. All right, we'll now resume the meeting of the Board of Supervisors. 
and proceed with item, where are we? 13, proclamations for super, um, we are, so I think we did skip one item, which is uh, item 11, the ordinance amending Santa Cruz County rent adjustments for mobile homes. And we will hear that uh, this afternoon after the 1.30 scheduled item uh, 14. So now proceeding with item 13, which is to consider authorizing the issuance of proclamations honoring Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Caput to be all signed by all members of the board. All right, well, um, does any member of the board want to start with comments? Supervisor Friend. I'll kick it off because I know there's gonna be so many nice things said, <laughs> at least about Greg, that I want to make sure that we also get something in about Ryan. It's good to see Neil here. Uh, Bruce and I and, and, and uh, Greg are old enough to remember when Neil was up here too. Um, but let me let me take a, in all seriousness, so I'm going to start with Ryan, then I'll move on to Supervisor uh, Caput. And so I've worked with Supervisor Coonerty for um, over 20 years um, during his time at the city of Santa Cruz. And th there really, it would be hard to find another person within our community that's so, that believes so much in public service, especially even in the face of a lot of the challenges and adversity that we have right now. Um, he's one of the strongest voices for the belief in good that the that local government and government in general can do. He's also one of the strongest voices in elevating other voices, especially behind the scenes. You make sure that whether it's a commission appointments, uh, whether it's just people that have an interest in, in public service or in his class, which I've uh, had the good fortune of guest lecturing, the amount of time that he will take with a student who has an interest in public service or doing public good is really remarkable. And these aren't things that the general community sees, but but to develop that kind of talent, to develop that kind of interest in public service and to truly believe in this position and the greater government sphere as a place for good is something that's just falls within his ethos. On top of that, he's an exceptionally uh, ethical person. Um, he's he's uh, uh, just somebody who uh, is viewed not just as a community leader, but across the country, he's elevated the voice of Santa Cruz County in ways that but not a lot of previous supervisors have a lot of it's very easy to become pretty myopic and pretty focused on issues locally but uh, supervisor coonerty has has been a strong voice both in sacramento and washington dc to elevate the needs of not just santa cruz county but counties across the country um I also say that he's uh clearly somebody who actually reads the packet which i'm not going to guarantee every elected that i've ever served with does um and so he's somebody yeah they deserve some clapping thank you yeah <laughs> um and and just that alone having an informed uh, somebody who's uh, informed, whether you agree with them or not necessarily on the issues, they help elevate the entire discussion of the policymaking of the county by raising uh, points that somebody else hadn't thought of. Um, Ryan, you've really served the role with dignity. You've served it um, uh, very well. Um, I've been proud to serve with you and with your with your dad previous to that. Uh, it is a, it is definitely a loss having you uh, step down, but but. Um, the one thing I do know is that you're going to continue to do good and make good wherever it is you end up after this, because you are fundamentally driven by how to make other people's lives better, especially the, those that are most marginalized, those that don't have a voice. And that's exactly uh, the way that the world becomes a better place. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Supervisor McPherson. McPherson. Yeah. Um, I can repeat a lot of that. And uh, the Coonerty, uh, name is just really, really significant in this community, this county, the city, with Father Neil there, if you will, uh, and uh, and Ryan. Uh, I just really have been impressed uh, week in and week out with the input, uh, honesty, direct, sensible uh, recourse that or uh, presentations that uh, Supervisor Coonerty has had. I mean, this is, he's been in 18 years of this uh, on the city council and as a board of, uh, county supervisor. Uh, really a phenomenal commitment to public service that has been dearly needed in this community. And I, I really appreciate his civil, uh, well, his ability to really uh, promote civil discourse in our community. Uh, Goings on here in the county board of supervisors, and the same goes for Supervisor Caput. Um, but I'm, I'm especially impressed. Uh, he he does such a broad range of things very well, and his really key interest, though, has been in serving the youth of our community and to see that they have a better life ahead of them and their families. Uh, the Thrive by Three, the the nurse uh, pro, the nurses program, the partnership program that he has there to give uh, low income um, people of color 
a, a better chance at promoting a, the family life that leads to better citizenship for everybody. Uh, it's really remarkable how he's put together some of these things and what he has done. And then he goes to the far reaches of the, the university where he he does the lectures there, as was mentioned. Uh, but again, addressing some of the really key issues, the long range development plan, which is <clears throat> always controversial and uh, not fun. I know uh, I, I can I can have uh, been up on that campus with you several times on that. But what he has done on that and some of the things that he's done on environmental protection and, and really protecting our shorelines here of Santa Cruz County and the, the state of California. He has been a voice, a big voice in that as well. Um, he, he really helped bring the Santa Cruz Warriors here too, which has been a phenomenal addition to our community. One that the, you can go there, at, uh, it's kind of like cheers. Everybody knows your name when you go in to see a Warriors game. And he has brought a community together in that respect as well. He's done so many things that uh, you just can't, can't mention them all. But I think in particular, his... Um, his commitment to making family life a better life for everybody in this county uh, and giving them a better opportunity is what really sticks in my mind of what he has done. Uh, I do appreciate working with him. I'm going to really miss working with him on this county board of supervisors. I can tell you that for the last eight years. He's been a tremendous advocate for so many things, as I've mentioned, and more. Uh, so I've, it's been a real pleasure to serve with you on the County Board of Supervisors, Ryan. I really appreciate it. And thank you for everything you've done for this company. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I'll add, Ryan, that uh, you know, you've, you've taught me. It's been an honor to serve with you on this board for the last two years. Um, and one of the main things you've taught me is not to let misinformation go unanswered whenever possible. Uh, we do a, a lot of sitting and listening um, to perspectives of all kind. Um, sometimes those perspectives can be fairly narrow though. And I've always appreciated the way that you step in uh, and provide more information to help really inform, uh, inform the debate. Um, you know, you've also always been very direct about what your constituents want and need and a great role model on that. Um, whether it's on issues of homelessness or youth education, you're really good at always bringing the conversation back to what the community wants to see done. Uh, and I've, you've really been a role model in that. Um, you know, finally, I look forward to continuing to watch your uh, accomplishments and pursuits outside of the Board of Supervisors. And it's clear that whatever you do, you'll be a vigorous champion for democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. I'll just make a quick comment to uh, uh, when. I didn't think there would be a, a supervisor better than Neil Coonerty, <laughs> uh, which I served with before. Still but I have to say, uh, uh, Ryan, uh, you are better than he was. Ceo <laughs> <laughs> uh, Palacios. Yes, um, Supervisor Coonerty, on um, behalf of staff and, and myself, I'd like to thank you for the years we've worked together, um, a lot of respect for you and your diligence and the great ideas that you've brought um, to this board and the deep policy knowledge as well. I really do appreciate, especially your work on our strategic planning efforts and your work uh, with children in our, in our county. Uh, thank you very much and we respect you because you've always respected us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor, I just want to add that, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with you for many years now, and um, it's been a real privilege. And uh, I, I very much appreciate you and, and your commitment to your community and how deeply you care for your community. And as a resident of Santa Cruz County, we're just really going to miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah. Um, so uh, Thank you, everybody, for the kind words, and thank you to the friends and family that have showed up today uh, and, and partners in the community. Um, I have a few words to say just because I don't think I'll be able to uh, torture people watching community television uh, with my with my ideas and comments much more. Um, but uh, so uh, I just want to note, um, so when I was sworn in eight years ago today, my son Kellen, who's right there, uh, was only four days old. Uh, my daughter Daisy was three. Um, so, sorry. Um, so at this moment of transition, it's shocking to me how they've grown um, into full-fledged human beings like during these eight years. 
Um, and now they're old enough and wise enough to be um, to to roll their eyes with boredom and tears uh, when their dad <laughs> gives speeches like this one. Um, eight years is a lifetime uh, to them, but it's only a minute for me. Uh, as I say goodbye, I'm struck by how the crises and the celebrations, the wins and the losses are just a blur. Public life um, moves very quickly, um, except during oral communications. Um, so um, 18, year, 18 years ago this week, as Bruce mentioned, uh, I was sworn into office for city council. My sister ran my campaign using her uh, considerable will and intellect to elect her considerably less talented older brother. Uh, my dad gifted me, uh, as everyone's mentioned up here, uh, a legacy of service and commitment to the community. Um, it's his gift is so great that I'm still called Neil at least a couple times a week uh, by people. Uh, and it's an honor every time it happens. Um, and, and 18 years ago, uh, this month, I'd gone out on a couple dates uh, with Emily, <laughs> Emily Bernard. Um, and she was funny and spirited uh, and had no interest in politics. <laughs> uh, and I can report that one marriage, two kids, and three campaigns later, she still doesn't care about what committees I'm on and serve on. Um, so it's with this history uh, and this being my hometown, you can imagine how personal all the decisions we made up here are. Um, I know my last speech, I should share some wisdom or a list of accomplishments, but that seems boring and self-serving. And those are two things I aspire not to be after elected office. Um, so I thought I'd tell you the one thing I got wrong uh, up here. And uh, anyone who's not satisfied with just the one thing I got wrong can ask my colleagues or my wife for a longer list uh, after, the, after this meeting. But um, in my family, stories are everything. My grandmother's told amazing, if not always truthful stories. Uh, they both vehemently believed in not letting facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, my parents and now my sister make their living in stories. Uh, they believe that a good novel can tell more about the human condition than any study or chart ever could. Uh, and they've been known to repeat the poet uh, Muriel Ruckreiser's observation that the universe is made of stories, not atoms. Um, that quote is beautiful. It's also factually wrong. The universe is made of atoms uh, and, and explained by science and math. Um, stories are wonderful things, but they're just that. They're stories. Uh, they don't need to be based on gravity or the laws of economics or science or reality. And in recent years, we've seen stories hijack our politics with incredibly dangerous consequences. Uh, to counter what I saw as the ridiculous myths and storytellings in our community, often seen in letters to the editor year after year, um, that I believe were preventing us from finding solutions to our challenges, I decided to focus on data. So my time in office has been about gathering, analyzing, and demanding data. I was relentless and I think at times obnoxious about it, um, but I found allies on the board here at, and in county staff, and we began tracking everything. You can now see the results of that effort um, in the county's operational plan. Uh, the dashboard, which is tracking in real time 180 objectives. Uh, you can see it in the rebuilding and the COVID dashboards, as well as the community program contracts. We can compare ourselves and key metrics to similar counties and see how we rank. I'm proud to say that Santa Cruz County is now a national leader in using data to make better decisions, get better outcomes, and do continuous process improvement. Um, during crises, that data saved lives. Uh, in normal times, it meant better services and programs for the most vulnerable. Tax dollars were saved, public safety increased, our environment protected. Um, over the last few weeks, I've been pouring over that data to see what impact our policies may have had. And I'm happy to report that for the most part, the trend lines are good. We should be proud, everyone up here, of what we accomplished. Uh, and everyone in the county staff who's who's doing the work day to day. Um, but after eight years of haranguing county staff and community program managers and anyone who was forced to interact with the county for fewer stor stories and better data, uh, the the numbers stored in my brain have been replaced with stories of my heart. Uh, I'm moved by the time that I saw my colleagues up here taking hard, unpopular votes because they believed it was best for the community. I'm inspired by the conversations I had with Carlos and his team about managing exhausted and scared human beings in an unparalleled series of crises. 
uh, and, I'm in, and the dedicated workers who put aside all those fears to do their job when the community needed it. <clears throat> I remember talking to people who were uh, crying after losing everything in a fire and then seeing hundreds of community, <clears throat> community members showing up to help. Uh, and witnessing a magnificent response to COVID, to the Trump administration attacks on vulnerable populations, and the mur murder of Sergeant G Gutzweiler. Um, for all the hours we spent in staff meetings, crafting additional direction and report facts uh, to get better outcomes to agenda items. Uh, as I clean out my office, I can only remember the laughter and the passions of meetings with Allison and Rachel and Andy every week. Uh, and I give anything to hear Allison tell us a story about how she spent the weekend with her girls. I guess what I'm saying is that we have good data in this community, but we have a great story. We don't tell those stories enough. Stories about the way we help each other, care about our environment, education, and small business. And stories about what we wish the world would be like for our kids. The Santa Cruz story is a unique and amazing one. I'm grateful to the voters for letting me be a, a character in their story for a little bit. Um, I can't wait to hear the next chapter from our new leaders and our chief storytellers, uh, from my colleagues up here. And I just want to say thank you. Does any member of the public wish to speak? <laughs> it's hard to follow that uh, excellent speech, I know. Um, you should let your dad go. <laughs> I'm Neil Coonerty, Ryan's dad. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the kind words. They're well-deserved and well-earned. Um, and then the second item I wanted to talk to after sitting through the last hour of your deliberations here, I really uh, think that retirement is the way to go. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Good morning, Supervisors and Chair Koenig. My name is Laura Marcus, and I'm a resident of the First District and also CEO of Danvis Community Dental Care now in its 30th year of serving Santa Cruz County residents. I'm here today to recognize the great work of Supervisor Ryan Coonerty, who as a city council member and mayor of the city of Santa Cruz and third district supervisor for the county of Santa Cruz has spent almost two decades being a servant of the people. Whether through support and recommendations for funding for local nonprofits like ours, to establishing new programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, which has supported hundreds of new families since its inception in 2016, and Semillitas, which funds college savings accounts as an incentive for healthy habits such as visiting the dentist. Ryan has always sought innovative ways to invest in the health of our community. Let Ryan's work be an example for all public servants. The last few years have been particularly challenging with COVID and the CZU fires, you never stopped working. Whether they were homeowners trying to rebuild after the fire, low-income seniors needing access to vaccines, or kids needing internet so they could remote in for school. You've been a tireless supporter of your district and beyond, and our community is so grateful for your commitment and dedication to making Santa Cruz County a wonderful place to live, even when times are hard. You will be missed in this role, but I know you will continue to support good work here. I wish you all the best in your new endeavors. And thank you again from Dientes, our board, our staff, and our 16,000 patients. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Marcus. I'm gonna just ask you to hold here in public for one moment. We do have a Justin Cummings, council member and supervisor elect, who I understand has stepped out of their city council meeting to be able to comment here and just wanna give him a chance to speak. Absolutely, Chair. Mr. Cummings, your microphone's now available. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. 
Well, thank you all for having me. I have an appointment I got to go to, but um, really just wanted to take a moment to thank uh, both Greg and uh, in particular Ryan for their years of service. And you know, really just wanted to speak um, to how appreciative I am for all of Ryan's years of service, but in particular during the pandemic, um, you know, as a, a newly a new incoming mayor and only my second year into being an elected official, um, there's no playbook for how you react to a pandemic and then layer on top of that social unrest and fires. And uh, Ryan was always a great partner on the board. And really um, it was, you know, through our ability to work together that we were able to really, you know, um, overcome a lot of the issues around the pandemic here in the city with keeping people safe and making sure that uh, we were able to get our economy up and rolling again. And um, it's through those kinds of partnerships that I hope we can um, just show to people in the community how we should be working together to really um, helping to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the people of, of Santa Cruz that we all care about. And so um, I really just want to thank you for all your guidance and for your years of leadership. And I hope to carry um, a lot of what I've learned from you with me as I enter uh, the position of third district county supervisor. So thank you and and um, and thank you all for your time and service. Thank you, Supervisor Elect. And we'll now come back to the chambers. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, my name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the Executive Director for Ventures and a former resident of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm currently in Felton, actually, Bruce. Um, but I just uh, wanted to take a moment to personally and professionally thank Ryan. The, the crying is contagious. <laughs> I met Ryan um, seven years ago uh, when we were talking about the uh, VITA, the Volunteer Income Tax Preparation Program. And it was such a refreshing meeting because all of you are wonderful, but we sat and it was maybe 10 minutes. Why is taxes important? How does it work? What's the data behind the money coming back to the community? And I loved it because it was an immediate um, connection around the focus of the well-being of our community and tying it to economic development, mobility, and things that really drive who we become as a society. And those conversations continued to where we had a, quite frankly, the birth of Semillitas started because we had a meeting. I was like, you know, all of this is great. And I have this great idea. Let's look at the data, look at the results that we have from evidence-based and say three times more likely to go to college, five times more likely to graduate, what it means for mobility, what it means for belonging, what it means for aspirations, and seeding the next 18 years of our community. And Ryan got it right away. Allison was a great partner. And, and to have that, that trust and dialogue, not always agreeing, because agreement is not necessarily the outcome. What we want to get to is inform, thoughtful decision-making. And for that, Ryan, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cadenas. I uh, want to thank all of you for your work for the county, um, but I am here today to specifically thank Ryan. Uh, my name is Julia Gadinsky. I'm a 20-year resident of Bonnie Dune, um, and I've had several interactions with Ryan over several issues over the year. I am uh, quite pleased to be here on a happy occasion, um, not with half of Bonnie Dune with me, with <laughs> you know, uh, uh, metaphorical pitchforks, but... Um, Ryan, you've been incredibly responsive to the needs of Bonnie Dune um, for years, including uh, ca cannabis legislation um, with the fires. And uh, not only have you been reactive, you've been very proactive. I really appreciate your proactivity um, with helping us deal with a sexually violent predator who may be my direct neighbor. Um, so I am just really appreciative of your responsiveness. You actually respond to my emails. Um, you have great staff. Rachel has just been wonderful. Um, so, um, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here too. Also here to um, basically show up for Ryan the way he showed up for Bonnie Dune and for Santa Cruz. You had us all crying in the back there, Ryan. Um, so I, I'm, my name's Kathy Toner. I'm also a resident of Bonnie Dune. I think I outrank Julia by a few years, 20 some years. 
and I, I'm speaking for many others who couldn't be here today, just to, to express our deep, deep appreciation. And the word that I wrote down that I've heard echoed here, um, and I think it just you just exemplified it in your final words um, in this in this role, is public service and servant leadership. And, and that's what we've seen and come to expect from you, and we're so grateful for it. Um, you've shown up for the community. You showed up during the fires. You were there, I was told, unloading hay for the horses as people, you know, above and beyond. Um, and not only took care of your constituents in your district and listened to us and solved problems and brought that same ethical leadership that has been mentioned to our community or to your constituents, clearly you had impact countywide and, and beyond. So I feel very lucky that we've had your um, leadership and your service. I want to thank your family for the sacrifices. I'm sure this has meant for them over the years. And um, just to express our appreciation, we had a very um, professionally made sign made for you as a memento. Um, and so thank you, Ryan. I can't wait to see what comes next for you. And uh, we just wish you all the best. Hi, I'm Mike Rotkin, one of your constituents. and. Uh, I want to thank you for many things. Uh, you, you've been incredibly responsive to people in the third district, but I think more importantly, you've been a supervisor for the entire county. And I think that's important. We shouldn't just take it for granted. Uh, often counties and other uh, areas where have districts, people end up narrowly focused on the interests of their immediate constituents. And I think that has not been the case with you. Your work really has been county, had an impact countywide. I also think that you served during a time when we had more crises than anybody could possibly imagine all at the same time. And I think you did a really good job of responding to those. You've always been really accessible, I think, to everybody throughout this county in terms of your work. And I do wanna thank you for the work you did on metrics in the county. Um, often we have a sense of like, well, how are things going or how are we doing? And to be able to actually have some you know, quantitative sense of when we're making progress and when we're falling short and need to do something, put more focus on a particular issue and try to address it. I think that's a lasting contribution that you've made that's gonna go on well beyond your years of service here. So thank you for everything that you've done. I think you've been a, really a model supervisor. Thanks for your service. Hi, my name is Carolyn Burke. I'm Assistant Director of Community Development and Infrastructure in the Planning Division. And I wanna say farewell to Greg and Ryan. Thank you so much for your leadership. And I have a few words for Ryan. Um, I want to celebrate your years of service, promoting civil discourse when we as a community disagree, holding a progressive vision for how development and environment can coexist, being a leader in championing alternative energy and leading with heart so evident as you advocated on behalf of your constituents rebuilding after the CZU lightning fire. You and your staff have always supported the planning department and now community development and infrastructure, and we will miss you greatly. Thank you. All right, so no one else here in chambers? Is anyone online? Yes, we do have speakers online. Tony, your microphone's now available. Thank you very much. I'm Tony Panetta, Government Affairs Manager for the National Office of Nurse Family Partnership and Child First. Our national office contracts with local agencies, such as county health departments in California, to deliver the nationally recognized Nurse Family Partnership Program to first-time moms who are pregnant and who are facing the greatest adversities to connect them to their own personal nurse during the first 1,000 days of their baby's lives, which is a pivotal time in early childhood development. Thanks to Super Kuna, Supervisor Coonerty's vision and commitment to families in the county, NFP has been delivered to nearly 300 moms and their babies since 2016. We appreciate being able to recognize and honor the work of both Supervisor Coonerty and Allison Endart to support moms and babies in the community by bringing NFP to Santa Cruz. Overall, our program's goals are to improve pregnancy outcomes, improve children's health and development, and improve families' economic mobility. We use a lot of data to speak to the supervisor community's points about being data-driven and data-informed. And I'd like to highlight one of Santa Cruz's successes with the program, premature births. Santa Cruz NFP has one of the lowest rates of premature births among our program in the state. 
It has a lower rate than the average for NFB moms across the entire country. Why this matters? Because there are fewer moms in Santa Cruz County who are at risk of health complications associated with premature birth. There are also fewer children in the county who are at risk of experiencing long-term health conditions and developmental delays that are associated with premature birth. This is exactly why Supervisor Coonerty's commitment to sustaining NFP matters. Because the families who the statistics say are more likely to face greater obstacles for success are now having stronger foundations to thrive in their health, in their education, and in their family's economic stability. The decisions that you all make matter and the difference on people's lives matter. We also appreciate Supervisor Coonerty's instrumental role in connecting community partners to refer into the NFP program and to identify revenues to deliver the program. When Santa Cruz wasn't eligible for federal funding to start NFP, his office got to work identifying Medi-Cal and local dollars to start Nurse Family Partnership and to sustain the program. And he has continued that commitment today, most recently by highlighting for federal officials why federal funding needs to be increased so that Santa Cruz and other communities can continue delivering these vital services. We're grateful for Supervisor Coonerty's long-standing commitment to the success of NFP in the county. And we agree with all of those who have come forward today to thank him for his advocacy on behalf of so many families. We also congratulate him on his tenure as supervisor and wish him well in his next ventures. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Call in user 3325, your microphone's now available. Good morning, this is a Najib Kamil, Senior Analyst with the Health Services Agency in the Public Health Division and the Children and Family Health Unit. Um, just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all the support and important work that Supervisor Coonerty has done for our home visiting program in the county. Um, you know, the numbers speak for themselves and each of those individual numbers has a story behind them. Um, it's a story of health access equity. It's a story of avoiding becoming uh, system involved. It's getting the, the important resources needed to have not just a surviving family, but a thriving family. Um, and so, you know, just wanted to really take a moment to acknowledge this amazing work um, also, all the legislative and policy advocacy that you have helped us do with our federal representatives. Um, and we appreciate you and, and hoping that, you know, we can keep you engaged with the home visiting program in other ways in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And David, your microphone is now available. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Dave Rubin, chair of the Rural Bunny Dune Association. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance to um, thank Ryan and and his assistant Rachel for their uh, great service. Um, I think it's not it's uh, it's not exaggerating to say that uh, Bunny Dune is a better place for their. Uh, for their efforts and service. So thanks and best wishes for your future. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. Well, Ryan, uh, Ryan, I'll give you this proclamation now, but you're not allowed to walk off with it uh, <laughs> until we officially have a vote. <laughs> All right, Supervisor Caput. Does anyone, uh, my colleagues want to lead off with comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll supervisor friend. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off because I, I think I've worked, um, I probably work closest with Supervisor Caput than any other supervisor on the board because of our districts being side by side. And and I just want to, um, since Supervisor Coonerty is still stuck up here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and actually the story is when when I was first elected, I contacted Supervisor Caput and I asked him if he'd be willing to take me on a tour of his district. 
to talk about and to show me the things that were most important to him. And it really was exemplified, in my opinion, by, by three things, by family, faith, and community. And what struck me was that normally when you would do a tour like that, you know, somebody, an elected would take you to places or issues that are of greatest importance. But for Supervisor, for Supervisor Caput, it was about meeting the people. Everywhere that you took me was to make sure that I met key people, not just in your life, including your wife and your kids, less kids at that time, as you've had more sense, the church and meeting the church leadership, Salvation Army, going to the Salvation Army leadership, going to the local schools to meet not just the school administration, but actually pick up your kids when they were done with school. And I think that that exemplifies the kind of elected official and leader uh, that you really are, that you care about people, that people really are your connection to this role. And it, to me, it, it harkens to a time when, when this position was much more about face-to-face -face contact and retail. We've been so tied up in social media and these sort of false connection points. And you've maintained these real connection points in South County, Greg, in a way that I don't think anybody really has in, in a long time. And, and you are so well respected there. And I'll leave on this. If there was one laser focused issue that you constantly wanted elevated, aside from redwood trees, <laughs> or that or whether there's actually peanut butter full within the agricultural <laughs> weights in every every year, it was the river. I mean, you made it very clear to me on that first day when we took that tour. It wasn't the river from a structural standpoint. You took me to one of the migrant camps to show how people's lives are impacted by us not doing our job by protecting them via the river, right? And you said to me, this is what happens when we don't invest. And it was something that I've carried, as you know, we've worked very closely together on making sure that that river uh, would have the flood protection that people deserve for the next generation. But your entire lens on it was the inequity, the way that people were being mistreated as a result of our lack of investment. So Greg, I, I just admire your laser focus on community. Um, Bruce had made a comment about uh, the way that Ryan approaches other people. And you are definitely one of the most gentle open, welcoming county supervisors and elected officials I've ever met, even with people you don't agree with. And you bring a, a civility that is long, that is needed. And I, in some respects, I wish we didn't even have to mention because it should just be commonplace, but it isn't. Uh, a true gentleman, Greg, um, you, you, you've brought a lot to this board and to this community. And, and, and that focus on people is something that I've carried with me from that first tour that we did together. So it's been a, an honor serving with you, Greg. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor yeah, McPherson. Think, yeah, I think the way I would describe uh, Supervisor Cabot, uh, Cabot is um, the surprise supervisor. First of all, he uh, defeats an established uh, incumbent for his first win. Then he be, uh, defeats a well-known police uh, professional for his second and then somebody that's very well known in the agricultural community for his third. And I, I think that people probably said, no, he's got an uphill charge. And I said, no, he'll win it. Uh, he's, believe me, I know how to win the close ones myself, but you've won a couple of close ones yourself. But, but uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, you know, you just seem to come out of nowhere. But the reason is, is because of what uh, Supervisor Friend said about uh, family, faith, and community that you knew your community so well. Uh, you've been a, a tireless advocate for the South County and uh, you had your three terms on the board and his time on the Watsonville City Council as well. Um, you've always reminded us of the importance of spreading our county reach uh, more equitably too, to reach uh, the historically underserved populations. Uh, and I, especially you've been so effective in representing your Pajaro Valley so well. Uh, I've especially appreciated your fo focus on youth, seniors, and veterans. And I know you were so excited about our Veterans Village that was in my district up in Ben Lomond. But you, uh, always the veterans, you really wanted to say they should get their their recognition. Uh, and you've, you've always really been tr right at the front of the line to make sure they receive that. Uh, and I just wish you all the best in your retirement. Um, as mentioned uh, with Supervisor Coonerty, I want to thank you and and, and Brian for and your family 
And uh, you have a, a growing young family, that's for sure. And I wish you the best. And I, I know that you're going to be able to appreciate them more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and uh, I'm just delighted to have served with such a grounded, uh, community-oriented professional supervisor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cabot. It's been, Cabot, it's been really a, a pleasure to serve with you. Thank you, Bruce. Supervisor Kennedy? Yeah, I want to add, um, so the, the trick to being an effective supervisor uh, is to get to three votes on any given issue. Um, and so often you're strategizing sort of where people will land uh, and whether they'll be in support or not support. Um, and um, with you as a, uh, when I'm looking for a third vote or I try to figure out where you are, um, it was remarkably easy because you just had to think about what would the average person in your district who just wants government to work for them think, right? And um, and you brought that value and that community community orientation um, to your decision making. And I've seen it when uh, you made decisions that are uh, unpopular or hard. Um, I think you landed exactly where your community wanted you to be. Um, and uh, at, the, at the end of the day, that's the best thing an elected official um, can often do uh, is, is to represent those people and make sure they have a voice in the system. And I appreciate your consistency uh, and, uh, and willingness to step up for, for your community. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. I'll add, Greg, uh, but you, you really taught me the value of being personable. You always greet staff up here as people first and then as, as staff second. Uh, and that's made a big impression on me. And you've always brought the same attention to people speaking at public comment as well. And I, as Zach said, I think that you are you get that because you're so great at meeting people where they're at in general. I, I uh, would love to have a tour of the fourth district with you sometime. I haven't gotten that yet, but I, I, I can tell you that um, your skills at walking and door knocking during campaigns are legend. And anyone running for public office in this county are, are going to hear about it um, because you're just so good at that. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll set an example for years to come on it. And finally, um, you know, you've always, as Ryan just said, always approached issues in terms that anyone can understand. Uh, for example, when it comes to climate change, the importance of, of just planting more trees. And uh, you know, I was I was pleased to see on the climate action and adaptation plan uh, that was scheduled later for today that that uh, that is one of the suggested strategies. Of course, it's using fancy language like expanding the urban canopy, um, and I'm sure you'll, you'll help use more direct language about just planting more trees. Um, but I'll remember that and uh, try to practice it whenever whenever possible. So thank you, Supervisor Caput. Thank you. Um... If I could say a few words, um, Supervisor Caput, on behalf of staff and myself, I want to thank you for years of service. Of course, you and I go back many, many years. I knew you and we're both Watsonville residents and I've known you before you became an elected official as a member of the community. And then later you became a city council member and you were my boss in Watsonville when I was city manager. And then I, we came here together in, in Santa Cruz. And I want to thank you for your many years of dedication. Uh, I'll especially uh, you know, just to echo the comment about you um, knowing everybody in town. I think that everybody in, uh, in the whole community feels like they know you and you are, are always open to reaching out and to listening to people and treating them with kindness and with honesty. And if anything, that's what you've always stood out for is just your kindness and your honesty. And people uh, know that they can always reach you. They know where to find you. And they do. <laughs> and I want to thank you because uh, you've been very kind to staff over the years. And we we really do appreciate your service. Thank you. Supervisor, I'll just follow up on that. That that, that is the word that comes to mind when I think about you um, is kindness and, and a quiet dignity that you served with for 12 years and very much appreciate uh, having worked with you and and the way that you are able to disagree without being disagreeable is a, just a shining example to all of us um, who do this work and um, just appreciate you and we'll miss you. Supervisor Caput, did you want to say a few words? Okay. Uh, 
With respect to everybody, uh, I want to thank uh, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, for blessing my family and friends uh, with 12 uh, wonderful years of representing uh, District 4 in South County. Y también quiero decir gracias a la Virgen de Guadalupe para su ayuda. Anyway, uh, my staff is here. Uh, I've got uh, Melanie uh, Martinez Salas back there, uh, Ramon Gomez, and then uh, Tony Gregorio. Thank you for watching my back uh, for the past uh, many, many years. And um, I appreciate all of it. Uh, you know, I could uh, sum up a lot of things. Uh, uh, we used to <clears throat> before the pandemic we we'd ha I'd have a lot of neighborhood meetings because uh, Tip O'Neill, a former speaker of the House, said all politics are local, and we would uh, before the pandemic we'd have uh, you know a neighborhood meeting maybe once a month or every other month, and uh, I was coming back from one. Uh, my son Robert was about ten years old at the time. Uh, this, so this was a number of years. He's 17 now. And uh, it was a, a heated conversation. Uh, people were kind of getting uh, out of hand, yelling and all that. And when we were driving back, uh, Robert said, uh, Dad, uh, are you a politician or are you a public servant? And... Uh, I had to think about it, actually. Uh, I wish I had an answer right away, but uh, hopefully I told him a little later, I said, I hope uh, that I'm a public servant because uh, that's what uh, you know we're supposed to do. And it's a term that uh, really means a lot. Uh, then uh, also, um, there was another Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn. Uh, he said, you can get a lot done in politics if you don't care who gets the credit. And so that's why I was always giving credit to Zach Friend for everything we did for uh, District 4 in South County. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, 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 I, I hope I've been an average uh, supervisor up here. And average is pretty good when I'm sitting next to uh, the quality that uh, representation that we have for all of Santa Cruz. So anyway, uh, it's uh, it's really been uh, wonderful. And uh, I want to, my, my wife and five kids, I'm looking forward to spending a little more time with them. And uh, also maybe uh, uh, help my wife out when we're doing all the dashing from the soccer to music to football, to, you know, better running back and forth. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's it's going to be, uh, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm also going to miss being up here. Uh, thank you to everybody, and I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Craig. Now, would any member of the public like to share some comments? Craig, uh, when you first ran for office, I didn't know you. Um, I'd heard that you were a very religious person, and frankly, that made me suspicious because there's an awful lot of hip hypocrisy that goes on within the faith community. And I have to say, you have certainly turned my mind around on that question as far as your, yourself is concerned. Um, you, you live your faith. It's really clear. And your humility in office, but much more importantly, your, your commitment to people and serving the community, it's, it, it knows no bounds. And it, I've just been so impressed with that, which is why I ended up supporting you for office the next two times that you ran. And I think, you know, as I say, I didn't start off in that point. I was really nervous about who this person was and what he was, you know, what, what kind of value, because we see at the national level with some people who claim to be religious, what the results are. That's not been the case with you. And it, you, you, I think you're a real credit to the faith community and 
give people a reason to think that there's some real value there that that you that gets contributed to the community. I also have to say on the Regional Transportation Commission where we serve together, there is nobody who is better at holding the feet of the state officials to the fire when it comes to delivering services to your constituents. And the way that people have spoke about this from the board, when when you talk about what's happening on Highway 152 or something, it's always with a story about some person that needs it. <laughs> some accident that's going to be averted, averted, that there's going to be a public result from it that matters to people. And it's clear that you really, your heart is in this. It's not just, you know, going through the motions or something. So I've been very impressed with your public service and I want to appreciate everything you've done for the public. Again, not just in your district, but on issues of, that have to do with what people need throughout this county. So thanks for your years of service. Hello, um, my name is Jonathan Engelman with State Senator John Laird's office, and I am here um, honored to be here on behalf of Senator Laird and outgoing Assembly Member Mark Stone to present both uh, Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Caput with these um, resolutions from the California State Legislature. Um, I'm not going to read them all, but they uh, they go into detail about your many accomplishments over the years. So um, on behalf of Senator Laird and, uh, and uh, Assembly Member Mark Stone, Thank you so much for your commitment to our county and good luck on your future endeavors. Thank you. All right, if there's no one else here in chamber, is there anyone on Zoom? We do not have any speakers left on Zoom. All right, I need a motion. Uh, move the recommended actions for approving the proclamations for both Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Caput. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll now resume the regular meeting of the December 13th Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. We did meet for closed session during the actions out of closed session. Not this afternoon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have quorum. Thank you. We'll proceed with item 14, which is to consider the Santa Cruz County 2022 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, or CAP, the greenhouse gas reduction targets for 2030 and 2045, the use of the 2022 CAP equity guardrails and the drought response outreach plan, and direct the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience to return on April 25th, 2023, with an update on plan promotion and implementation as outlined in the memorandum of the director, the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience. And for a report on the CAP here today, we have our Director of the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience, uh, David Reed, and Tatiana Brennan, Senior Analyst with the office. Please take it away. Um, thank you, Chair Koenig and uh, members of the board. Uh, Carlos uh, Palacios, County Administrative Officer, just wanted to start uh, with a few introductory comments uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Dave Reed and Tatiana Brennan for their hard work on this. They've done a great job, as you're going to see, as you've already seen their work today. Uh, I wanted to provide a bit of context and background to the work you're about to hear about. Uh, about five years ago, actually it's longer, seven or eight years ago, we started um, what's now known as Central Coast Community Energy in this county. Uh, this county is the founding um, jurisdiction for that group, uh, 3CE. And uh, Chair uh, Koenig, I know that you're aware you've been uh, following our work. Um, Supervisor McPherson has also been very involved and was one of the founding members along with a staff uh, person, Jenny Johnson. And I uh, wanted to let you know how important that work is as it's foundational to the work we're going to hear about today with regard to the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. If we are electrifying our vehicles 
our residences and our commercial buildings, it does no good if we are using dirty electricity. It's just uh, spinning our wheels. But the fact that we are already at 60% uh, uh, carbon-free uh, renewable energy through uh, the efforts of 3CE and on track to be at 100% uh, carbon-free renewable energy by 2030 is due to the efforts of that group. And it was uh, that idea that was birthed at this county. Santa Cruz County is the one where that idea first came about. It is where all the work to put that group together came about through, uh, especially through the work, as I said, of Jenny Johnson, uh, but also uh, through Dana McCray, myself and my staff and, and Supervisor McPherson. Um, and that's where we have been able to arrive at to this point where we are confident by 2030, we're going to be 100% of renewable energy. And so uh, as we continue forward with these efforts that you're going to hear about, I want to urge this board to continue to support Central Coast Community Energy. Uh, Supervisor McPherson has served on the board of the policy board and has been at the chair of that board. I have been the chair of the operations board. We have devoted a tremendous amount of energy to helping that agency to thrive and prosper. Uh, other agencies are members and we now have five counties and over 34 jurisdictions, uh, but we continue to be one of the agencies that is most supportive of that group and their efforts are foundational to the efforts that we're going to talk about today. So I just wanted to provide that bit of context and thank you for your support and your continued support and allowing me to serve on the operations board and encouraging Supervisor McPherson to serve on the policy board. And hopefully in the years to come, we will continue to support them so that they are successful, so that we are successful together. Thank you. Thank you so much to Jay Reed and Tatiana Brennan. Thank you, uh, CEO Palacios. I wanted to just make a couple opening comments before handing it off to Tatiana for today's presentation. Um, and just to highlight and expand upon the theme that Carlos Palacios, our CAO, just articulated, this notion that we can go fast alone or we can go far together is really critical um, in this endeavor. And the successes of 3CE is, is one example of that, but I wanna highlight a couple others really quickly, because I think what we recognize is that together we can accomplish a lot. And if we're, and if we're unified in that effort. So I've been with the county for 15 years and I remember being on the technical advisory committee of 3CE in conversations with Allison Violante and others at the Harbor. And to see that to come to fruition is amazing. I was also in conversations around what buckets, remember the buckets of measure D, and what buckets we should use and how we should allocate those tax revenues from that tax measure. And now we can celebrate $105 million coming into our county through the California Transportation Commission. The Pajaro Levy, a $400 million project led by supervisors, friend in Capit, but a collaborative effort nonetheless, and a huge, huge um, effort to bring those resources into the community are all demonstrations. And, the, and most recently, the Watsonville Hospital raising over $60 million in, in legislative actions in record time, demonstrate that when we work together, we can go far. And this CAP process designed and implemented by Tatiana Brennan is an embodiment of that collaborative spirit. And it's intentional and it's designed to be collaborative, both in the development of the CAP, but also in the implementation of the CAP. And so that's what's inspiring to me is that I know we can do and accomplish great things as, as the CAO articulated with 3CE and these other examples and to achieve what we need to achieve by 2030 and 2045, as Tatiana Brennan will articulate for you, we need to go together. We need to work together um, and be unified. And I have confidence that we can do that. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Tatiana. Thank you. Hello, Board of Supervisors. Let me turn my microphone. Can you hear me? Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for this opportunity to present you and the public with the 2022 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. We will start with an agenda of today's presentation. We begin with a brief introduction to global climate change, a look at how climate change is experienced locally, and an exploration of our local greenhouse gas emissions. Then we move to our response to climate change, 
the 2022 CAP. We'll present how the CAP was developed, the content, and our focus on equity. The 2022 CAP acknowledges the Amamutsun Tribal Band, the original stewards of this land we now call Santa Cruz County. And we share with you a land acknowledgement prepared by them. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. Sadly, there are no known survivors of the Awaswa speaking peoples. We have an obligation to ensure they are honored and never forgotten. Today, the Amamutsun tribal band, composed of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. We wish to express gratitude to the people that contributed to the development of this cap. There are too many to name individually, but we have grouped them by their role in the cap process. Cap development was on an accelerated timeline and we couldn't have achieved the goal if it weren't for the contributions of each of the following. The three work groups, the steering committee, project sponsors, interns, mentors, community organizations, Central Coast Community Energy, and Rincon Consultants. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge members of the audience who worked on the CAP. If you contributed to the CAP, please stand. Thank you for your time, effort, and contributions. They are acknowledged and appreciated. There is no planet B. We must act now. We would like to start with a brief introduction to climate change. The atmosphere is critical in trapping heat that keeps our planet warm. Burning fossil fuels puts more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere causing Earth's atmosphere to trap more and more heat. Over time, gases in the atmosphere from increased carbon dioxide emissions have been trapping more heat and changing Earth's natural greenhouse effect. One of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the burning of fossil fuels for heat and electricity. Why is it happening? In this graph, we can see the connection between an increase in CO2 and an increase in temperatures. On the left of the chart are global temperatures, and on the right is concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. The x-axis, starting with 1880 and ending, ends in 2020. This is often called the J-curve graph. What we see here is a rapid increase in human-caused CO2 emissions since the Industrial Revolution. What's powerful about this graph is that you can see the profound effect our emissions increase has had on global average temperatures. Initially, we used global warming to describe the effect of increased CO2, but now we know that it is the intensity and variation in extreme weather that is what we will experience and are currently experiencing. What are our options? We can address climate change through different options, reducing fossil fuel emissions and through carbon sequestration. This graph shows the burning of fossil fuels from building and vehicles going into the atmosphere. It also shows carbon being absorbed by plants and the soil. Carbon sequestration is the long-term storage of carbon in plants and soils and occurs naturally. An example is forest regrowth, which is a form of carbon sequestration. We are currently experiencing climate change in Santa Cruz County. 
A climate vulnerability assessment of our county found in Appendix C of the CAP identified several climate hazards we are subject to, with the most impactful being extreme heat, drought, wildfire, air quality, and flooding. What do climate change events look like in Santa Cruz County? We are starting to see the effects of climate change in our county, as you can see in these pictures. These events will only grow in frequency and intensity over time if we do not decrease our CO2 emissions and make other changes to our lifestyles. What do these changes impact? Climate change affects all the habitats in our county, from the redwood forests to the rivers and streams and to our beautiful coastline. Who do they impact? Humans are not the only species impacted by climate change. There are 2,579 animal species in Santa Cruz County, and 122 of them are threatened. Climate change affects our ecosystems, and as the temperature rise and the climate changes, more species will be at risk. And now we look at our local 2019 greenhouse gas emissions. Here we see a representation of the different sectors contributing to greenhouse gas emissions in the unincorporated area of the county. If we add up emissions from passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles, public transit, off-road equipment, we see that 70% of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the transportation sector. If we add up the emissions from residential natural gas, non-residential natural gas, propane and electricity, we see that 25% of emissions are from the built environment. The 2022 cap includes strategies targeted at reducing emissions from these two sectors, in addition to emissions from waste. I want to point out that if we looked at this pie chart 10 years ago, we would see a much higher contribution of emissions from the built environment. Due to the successful efforts of Central Coast Community Energy, we have one of the lowest rates of emissions from residential and non-residential electricity usage in the state. We have looked at our greenhouse gas inventory. Now we would like to focus on state requirements to reduce emissions. We are required by the state to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And in order to do so, we need to set goals. The state has set two primary goals, one for 2030 and another for 2045. In the next few slides, I will walk us through this complex but foundational piece of the 2022 cap. Let's start with our, base, our baseline. The state uses 1990 emissions levels as the baseline or comparison amount when accounting for changes in successive years. In 1990, our greenhouse gas emissions were 763,809 metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. For the purpose of this presentation, I will not use the full terminology, which is metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions, but instead will just refer to the numerical amount. Here we can see our current 2019 greenhouse gas inventory amount, which is roughly 691,262 and is 9% below our 1990 baseline amount. Existing state and federal legislation will decrease emissions across the state. The horizontal blue line shows where we expect our emissions to be in 2030 and 2045. When we factor the impact of state and federal legislation, we can see a steady decrease over time. And this is again for unincorporated County of Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County. Now let us look at how much we are responsible for decreasing. We see the baseline, our current greenhouse gas inventory amount here, and the blue line indicating expected decreases as a result of state and federal legislation. The red line represents the additional amount we need to decrease locally 
through policy changes. Now I'm going to explain the state requirements that you see here. In 2030, SB 32 requires us to have decreased our emissions 40% below our 1990 baseline amount. We can expect our greenhouse gas emissions to be 649,396 with just state and federal legislation. But that is not sufficient to meet the goal of 458, 280, 458,285. We will need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 191,111 to reach the 2030 target. For comparison, that amount, the 191, is similar to the entire city of Watsonville's 2017 greenhouse gas inventory. Where we see the most reduction required is the AB 1279 target for 2045, which requires net neutrality. This means no greenhouse gas emissions should go into the atmosphere. 85% of greenhouse gas emissions per AB 1279 need to be eliminated. The remaining 15% of emissions must be captured through carbon sequestration or other carbon storing strategies. To put this in context, this amount here, this is 15% of 2019 emissions. So if we consider that in 2019, we could only emit 15%. And now we would like to present you with the 2022 cap. The 2022 CAP key components. All of the four components represent core philosophical elements of the CAP. The key components are adaptation, mitigation, accountability, and equity. They are all interconnected and represented in the goals, strategies, and objectives. A representative process with broad engagement. County staff committed over 1,120 hours to the development of the CAP, coming together in person every other week and doing preparation work in between meetings. Five youth from high school, community college, and four-year universities have contributed countless hours to developing the CAP, engaging in local government, and working on their capstone projects. The 2022 CAP was designed in the spirit of collaboration and the goals, strategies, and objectives were developed based on the existing climate action plans in Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Integration with local initiatives. The 2022 CAP builds off of existing initiatives, both those that focus on process improvement and those that are more technically focused. Initial stakeholder outreach. Although the CAP was on an accelerated timeline, we built in a month of stakeholder outreach to community organizations and government entities. The 2022 CAP is founded upon seven goals, affordable housing, healthy ecosystems, healthy communities, decarbonization, resilience, staff engagement, and a programmatic approach. These goals address the transformational change required to reduce our emissions at the rate the state requires and to adapt our built and natural environment to be resilient to climate change. The 29 strategies are founded upon these seven goals. 2022 CAP framework. The framework consists of seven goals 29 strategies, and 167 objectives. We aren't going to go through each strategy and objective, but we will present you with our priority strategies. Strategies will be evaluated every four years, objectives every two years. Five departments are leads on the 29 strategies, with OR3 the lead on 13, CDI lead on 10, GSD lead on four, HSA the lead on one, and ISD the lead on one. 
The 29 strategies align with the seven goals and the 167 objectives provide action steps for achieving the strategies. Priority mitigation strategies. We have selected priority strategies that address the sectors with the highest greenhouse gas contributions and are expected to have the highest impact on decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. These strategies address clean energy, eliminating fossil fuel use in vehicles and buildings, promoting higher density zoning, reducing the carbon footprint of our landfill, optimizing remote work and internet connectivity. Engaging in state and federal legislation that addresses climate change is also a priority strategy. Priority adaptation strategies. Adaptation is a key component of the 2022 CAP, and these prioritized strategies promote resilience and incorporate a long view perspective of local climate change. By adapting our county infrastructure and building all hazard community centers, we are preparing for the impacts of climate change on our built environment and on the people experiencing the effects of climate hazards. Strategies that address forest health, water systems, and carbon sequestration are all designed to maximize our natural resources and promote resiliency. Effective monitoring and evaluation of all these efforts is key to understanding our success and barriers. 2022 CAP objectives. Each long-term strategy has objectives outlining two-year incremental actions towards achieving the goal. Work groups determine the actions necessary by using this table. This framework incorporates a holistic perspective on achieving the strategies by looking at several factors that result in the completion and success of a strategy. We started with a two-year objective for the strategy and identified the engagement and education necessary to create movement on a large scale and engage with existing efforts. Then we included any code changes that need to be made and identified any partnerships with others in the community or county. And finally, we identified a plan for funding the strategy. The objectives for each strategy can be found on pages 34 to 56 of the 2022 CAP. We are asking you to approve the seven goals, 29 strategies, and 167 objectives in the 2022 CAP. Equity guardrails. The Climate Vulnerability Analysis and Social Vulnerability Index, both found in Appendix C, provide information on climate hazards and an identification of the groups most impacted by climate change. The 2022 CAP recognizes that the burden of climate change is disproportionately dis distributed due to long-standing systemic inequities. The guardrails provide an equity-informed structure for improving outcomes for vulnerable populations and underinvested communities at risk. The equity guardrails can be found in Appendix D of the CAP. Equity criteria. There are a set, set of six criteria that address components necessary for a strategy to build resilient capacity within populations most at risk and underinvested communities. In the 2022 CAP, we assessed the strategies for improvements to health and safety, financial benefits, cultural alignment, the potential for displacement, increasing investment, and providing for green job development. Equity matrix. The equity matrix is an initial test of the guardrails on the strategies. Each strategy was assessed, and if it did not align within the guardrails, it was adjusted based on the findings. Additional detail on the equity matrix can be found in Appendix E. We'd like to walk you through one of the strategies as an example. 
Strategy seven reduces vehicle miles traveled through higher density zoning and optimizing the use of remote work. This strategy can be found on page 39 and 40 of the CAP. The strategy is long-term and will be assessed in four years for any adjustments needed. The lead department is CDI with support being provided by OR3. There are five objective categories, and after two years, these will be evaluated for completion or barriers and adjusted as needed. The implementation objective includes three primary actions, updating land use and transportation planning, updating the housing element, and developing a prioritization matrix for housing element rezone sites. The engagement objective involves educating and informing groups of the vehicle miles traveled mitigation bank and regularly updating the housing element project website. Code adoption includes approving the housing element and rezoning of properties to meet RENA requirements. Key partners developing the VMT mitigation bank program will be Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and the city of Watsonville. And finally, a plan for funding the strategy is included. Work has already begun on this strategy. On December 6, 2022, the board approved the sustainability update and the VMT mitigation bank. And implementation work has begun. The update to the housing element has also begun and CDI will come before the board in early January, 2023, seeking approval of the outreach strategies. Equity guardrails applied. This shows the result of the equity guardrails applied to the strategy. The matrix shows how a strategy, when implemented with fidelity, will align with the guardrails. However, it is through consistent and regular evaluation that we will assess whether these criteria were met in practice. Drought response outreach plan. The drop played a key role in informing the drought strategies, and we would like to invite the plan's author, Sierra Ryan, Water Resources Manager, to say a few words at the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Koenig and uh, Supervisors. Thank you for having me. I'm Sierra Ryan, Water Resources Manager in Environmental Health. Um, frequent and intense drought is clearly one of the most concerning anticipated and currently experienced outcomes of a changing climate. In September 2021, Governor Newsom signed the Drought Planning for Small Water Suppliers and Rural Communities Bill, uh, referred to as SB 552. SB 552 places drought and water shortage planning responsibilities for water systems and wells serving up to 14 households on counties. The required outcomes of SB 552 include a plan, for examining vulnerabilities and coming up with solutions for those systems, as well as a standing oversight body. In December 2021, the Water Advisory Commission, which is the commission that advises your board on water-related issues, voted to become the standing oversight body. In alignment with the requirements of SB 552 to use a comprehensive planning process, they created a a working group known as the Drought Response Working Group, which included three members of the Water Advisory Commission, including the Small Water Systems representative, as well as board members from th each of the three groundwater sustainability agencies in the county, a representative for services for underserved communities, and two at-large representatives. Um, the county water resources staff worked with this working group um, who met four times to develop what became the Drought Response and Outreach Plan, or DROP. Um, and then we were lucky enough to get to work with Tatiana and Dave to incorporate it into the CAP. The DROP includes several sections, um, primarily including background information about SB 552 and how the county is complying with the law, uh, an analysis of water resources and vulnerabilities, uh, both social and physical within the county is particularly focused on residents relying on wells and small water systems, 
uh, the county's plan to improve data collection and provide resources to well owners and customers of small water systems. Um, focus on emergency response. Um, so examples include after a mudslide or a, a wildfire, ensuring that people have access to water as quickly as possible. Um, and a summary of recommendations from the drought response working group, which staff will be incorporating into our work plan to implement this over the next few years. Um, I'm just really proud of the work that we've done over the last year. It was a really heavy lift. Um, there's a lot of work ahead of us, but I think that with the support of the Water Advisory Commission and OR3 and their staff, I think we're going to be able to move forward. Thank you. Twenty twenty two CAP website. The CAP can be found on the OR3 website with all the components covered in the document and appendices. The site is in story map form, allowing visitors to interact with climate change components and even see how Live Oak has changed over the years. Next step, implementation. The next step is implementation, which will include developing community-wide indicators for goals, metrics for the strategies, quantification of specific reductions necessary to achieve state greenhouse gas reduction targets, a robust application of the equity guardrails, and we will work on community engagement and messaging. This is not a one-time thing. This is our future. Thank you. And this concludes our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Brennan. Thank you, Director Reed. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Supervisor McPherson? Mr. Chair, yeah, I might have some a long comment. In fact, uh, this is um, truly a remarkable report that you've put together and you're to be congratulated. I want to thank each and every one of you who are in this room and for everybody else who has had so much to do with getting us to this point where we are today, which is really about ahead of just about everybody else I know. And uh, and just helping us move along farther as we as we go in the future uh, of addressing the challenges of uh, climate change. Um, we are now um, and uh, you know, with Monterey Bay Community Power that just did become Central Coast Community <coughs> Energy with the help of so many people uh, throughout the region. Uh, just to let you know, the Triple C is. Um, it has a, over 400,000 customers. Um, it is, uh, we're on track uh, to reach our goals very quickly, much more quickly than the state in general. And um, it's, um, it's something that um, has been a real uh, satisfying issue to get 34 governing agencies from Santa Cruz County to Santa Barbara County engaged in this, this effort. Um, it's truly remarkable and it's because of people like you who put us there and put uh, Santa Cruz County in the lead. And I, I really want to thank you for everything that you have done to get us here. And I'm, I'm energized to see where we're going to go in the future as well. Um, I want to thank the uh, Office of Response, uh, Recovery and Resilience for its uh, thorough report. This is a big one, uh, a CAP, the Climate Action Adaption Plan or CAP. And I, I, the, the county commissions in general some that have been mentioned, especially the Commission on the Environment for getting us here where they are today, we are today. Um, the, the Commission on the Environment uh, formed an ad hoc committee to review the details of CAP and uh, had some meetings to get us where we are today. And it's important that the planning process was cross-departmental. As you can see from this report, integrating county expertise at all levels. Uh, so owners, ownership and implementation uh, can also take place at all level, levels. I would like to highlight a few parts. Uh, you've been mentioning many, and thank you for that presentation again. Uh, of the letter the board received from the Commission on the Environment, which I think are worth mentioning, the CAP really effectively analyze a, a complexity of economic governance, communications, advocacy, infrastructure, transportation, and land use issues that make a case that there is no one size fits all in us uh, and our approach to mitigation and the adaptation uh, measures that we're, we still must face. 
Um, and the commission also points out uh, that to execute this plan, we are going to meet, uh, need much more funding uh, than is currently available. But I think uh, the mood and I know of this county and I think of this state is very much on our side to get us there. And I, I'm encouraged um, that the federal and state government has made more funding available, uh, especially for resiliency projects at this time. And I hope that the Office of OR3 will make uh, its primary focus to lead uh, the regional effort to garner some of that funding. And I think we have been very successful at that. So it's very encouraging to see that. And as, as much as I appreciate the work, I think the board and the public could have greatly benefited from more time with the documents presented here, given the complexity, but I, there's a sense of urgency. So we really need to get at this at this time. We can always make it better, and I think we will, but this is a great format for what we need to do. And I, I, knew, I know that we have the sense of urgency to move forward, um, to meet our operational priorities with meaningful metrics, as you've explained. Um, so I ex uh, expect to support the plan recommendations that are here. And I, I would like to request of staff, uh, just what you need, another you know, request, uh, that prior to coming back to the board in April, I think is the next time you'll be coming to, to us uh, with this, uh, with a proposed implementation plan, um, you provide the board offices and members of the public uh, to review that at least two weeks in, in advance. And I know this is, uh, you know, we've, we've really stepped on it to, to get us here, and I think it's good. Uh, we are in a great spot, and we're going to get better. And it's because of people like everybody in this room and many, many more who have said, uh, yeah, we want to be on board with this. And I might say that in the triple C as well, that 95, 97% of our customers are in line with triple CE. So it's very encouraging. And I can't thank enough. Uh, thank you for your kind comments, uh, Mr. CAO, but I want to just have them come back to you as chair of the operations board of triple CE. It's been really, really important. Uh, and as usual, uh, Santa Cruz County is at the front of the line in making this happen. So I appreciate everybody's efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Kennedy. I'll just say, I mean, I, you outlined this uh, in advance for us. Um, so I may I ask most of my questions then. I just want to appreciate the effort and the work that's gone into both having an inclusive process and embedded values, but then also to get to real numbers and outcomes that we can demonstrate to the community so that they can um, both change their behavior, make investments, and see the reductions that we desperately need uh, for, for future generations. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Cabot. Uh, th uh, thank you very much for the report. This is a awful lot that we're gonna have, to, what you're gonna have to do. <laughs> See you. So, hey, good luck. Uh, anyway, uh, I wanna thank you for the report. I uh, Our environment is, uh, uh, if we destroy it, we're we're in big trouble. So uh, we're at a critical point, I think. Uh, can you imagine if uh, all of this uh, uh, pollution and everything was taking place for the last 200 years and all that? Uh, we wouldn't be able to reverse it. But now, you know, it's been about 100 and something years. And uh, I guess one of the big things is, of course, uh, plastics. Uh, plastics is, you know, everywhere. Like I said, what if we had plastics 200 years ago? Uh, where, where's the tipping point on some of this stuff where you, you can't, uh, where we can't go back? We can't somehow clean it. Is, is there a tipping point? Do we know? I know it's a tough question, but I yeah, I mean, in, I think in terms of the plastics production in our in our waste stream, the county has been a leader in trying to find as many places that we can eliminate that right from the start of the plastic bag ban um, to trying to eliminate single use plastics in our uh, commercial and and re restaurant industry. So, I mean, I think it's still emerging. We still have to address agricultural plastics here at the, at the local and regional level. Um, and folks are certainly trying to find different ways of producing 
materials not using petroleum, you know, so they're biodegradable plastics, but we certainly need to get them out of our oceans and, and, uh, and waste stream as much as we can. Yeah. And then one, another question, maybe there's no answer for it. Uh, let's say we didn't uh, put any more plastic into the ocean, into the streams, into the water, into everything we're talking about. Is there, is there a point where it actually gets so small and smaller that does it ever go away? Yeah, I mean, I think there there are technologies that are being looked at for the microplastics um, filtration. Uh, so the board, this board discussed at one time requiring a microplastics filtration system, like basically the back end of your washing machine. Yeah. So that that wastewater would eliminate the microplastics, but that's still an evolving technology for sure. Yeah. And where would that go? If let's say we well, you would have... filter it out, and then you would try and dispose of it in an appropriate manner. Yeah. So that it wouldn't go into the waste stream maybe, and then ultimately uh, like out to the ocean. Maybe burn it or something. Huh? Possibly, yes. Yeah. So there are we are looking at waste to energy technologies through CDI to try and find ways to 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 utilize our waste in a more effective way. Um, through waste to energy technologies that are emerging. Yeah, and uh, some of the some of the stuff we send it to, where they make uh, tools and stuff like that, uh, where they have uh, they're forging in big fires, and somehow they're able to use it. Is is uh, I don't know how far that's gone. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there's always uh, further exploration into how to reuse the the products from our waste stream we to optimize to get them. rid of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, I just wanted to bring up a couple of things that that I know that we've discussed previously. I mean, I think the report did touch on a couple elements that I think we really should amplify and focus on, and that includes the remote work element and broadband expansion. And the reason that I say that is because a lot of elements within the report are absolutely essential, but they're also intermediate to long-term uh, transitionary things, including changes on new construction, for example, which we know is not is very important. And the board recently in the building standards changed electrification within the urban services line. But, but these are, um, kind of additive changes over the course of time that will, while making a difference, don't address the immediate element. One thing that we saw during the pandemic was those who are able and recognizing there's an entire sector that is not uh, to to expand into the remote work world. Uh, it did have a pretty significant impact on the environment, as you may remember. Um, and we had some of the the best air and water quality that we've had in decades as a result of it. And so I do think that just the county is the second largest employer in the county behind the university. And I think that targeting major employers on policies like this would have a pretty significant and immediate impact on this, given the fact that, as you note, a significant, the highest percentage of GHGs is from the transportation sector. A lot of that are people commuting from where housing is available in our county to where jobs are. That job housing imbalance, I believe, is one of the greatest contributors to regional GHG, and that's something that the board is working to address through changes in affordable housing. Uh, but those, again, are long-term situations because, I mean, the reality is, if you are, um, you know, if you if you if you're domiciled in a location, you've developed community in a location. Even as things change, you probably won't necessarily move from that location, and even if it's a 20-mile commute. So we need to accommodate the reduction of those cars flat out. So I would like to see as part of our process that we take a much more strident advocacy role, not just within our own organization, but with other major employers to allow for this to happen, because I think that this would, would have a pretty immediate impact. But it also doesn't really cost anything in the same way as some of these major infrastructure changes. The work of, of Supervisor McPherson and Mr. Palacios and Jenny Johnson and Allison and, and you, Dave, um, on uh, 3CE is is unmatched, uh, quite frankly, on the changes. It's also a, a, I mean, a multi-billion dollar investment through multiple counties and takes a significant amount of time. And it's still the standard, uh, it's still using standard infrastructures as a change of how we're purchasing power. My point is, is that there are shorter term solutions that I think that we can emphasize, recognizing that 
Um, uh, in the short and intermediate term, we're not going, when we're talking about service reductions on Metro, for example, I think, you know, electrification of fleets and the reality that people are still going to be commuting distances. How do we either A, afford that in a cleaner way through the electrification of vehicles and or B, um, just change work patterns in such a way that allows people to do it from uh, a carbon neutral way, which is something that's completely within our power as long as we can provide uh, the back end infrastructure through broadband expansion. I just don't think that these are uh, that costly or technically complex, and I think that they would have a pretty significant impact. So I just wanted to highlight th these were were bullet points that you had in the presentation. I recognize that they're longer than that in the entire um, in the entire document, but I think that they should be a priority. I mean, I think that they should be what we actually emphasize in the short term in order to to uh, get to immediate results. And so I just wanted to share that. I mean, that that comes with the fact that we can even have this conversation. The fact that we are having this conversation shows the values and ethos of this community in this county and the fact that, uh, you know, the leadership of your team. So I wanted to appreciate that. But I did want to share those thoughts of what I think we should be prioritizing in the next, say, 12 to 36 months. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. I'll start with just a few questions. Um, the first is on transportation, uh, which, as you pointed out in the in the report, counts for seventy percent of all our emissions. How will we know if we're successful in uh, terms of reducing vehicle miles traveled or having people shift to electric vehicles? What what, what are we measuring as far as um, you know, to, to determine our emissions there? And and yeah, what are we tracking? So right now. We haven't we haven't designed metrics for those specific strategies, but I can tell you that we will have them when we return in April. And just at the offset, um, we can definitely look at rebates and how many people have have um, taken advantage of those. But there are also other ways that we can look at vehicle miles traveled, and we will come back to the board with those. And not only will we come back to the board with those metrics, but also we'll come back with the targets for what we expect to see in terms of decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions to meet the 2030 and 2045 state targets. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think in one of our conversations, you mentioned one of the, one of the things we could measure is actually just total amount of gasoline sold in the county as well. I mean, uh, and that struck me because, you know, we talk about climate change and emissions, and these are all things that are largely invisible unless until one of these disaster events happen. Um, but gallons of gasoline sold in the count, county is so tangible, right? Um, we've got to get less people filling up at the pump. I mean, I can say it's absolutely my least favorite thing to spend money on <laughs> is gas. Um, but we have to, you know, there's still like that at some point that it feels like a necessity and we have to provide alternatives to people. I mean, the most natural thing, of course, to, to get people to buy less gas would be to increase the cost of gas and increase gas taxes. Uh, that's not within the authority of this board. And of course, it also has real political challenges as we've seen just with the response to the high gas prices in the last year. So I mean, really, if we're going to take action on that, it's it, as you said, it's going to have to be in terms of providing alternatives um, in um, incentives and uh, and rebates for for different types of uh, transportation. Um, my other question is, are, are all the neighboring counties and jurisdictions using exactly the same methodology? And, you know, the reason I ask that is, I mean, infill development as one of our leading strategies, I mean, it makes perfect sense. We, we need to get people living closer to where they work. Um, you know, as I've said before, I think we can all understand the carbon footprint associated with an Amazon package. Uh, you know, if something, a product being produced in China and delivered to our doorstep with a, a fossil fuel using truck. Um, but there's a carbon footprint associated with uh, the people providing us services every day, whether it's, you know, cutting our hair or the bank teller or, um, you know, selling us a plant, um, a lot of those people have to commute in from other communities. And so, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense that if we uh, build housing locally and they can live locally, we'll reduce our, our net emissions. However, what if they don't live in the county, right? I mean, if we build all this housing here, um, you know, I can see how maybe we just stay even because now someone who maybe was living in King City or Hollister is able to live in Santa Cruz. Are we going to be able to go back and compare to surrounding counties and um, see, oh, hey, maybe you're counting on your balance sheet, some of the uh, effects of what we did here? 
We can certainly. And and to answer your first question, we do use the same methodology. That's um, it's standard to use the same methodology across jurisdictions. And that was definitely a value that we had going into this. That's why we partnered with city of Watsonville, city of Santa Cruz, and we hired the same consultant that they had used as well. So that's something that you'll see in this cap, but I also want to point out that the counties and cities are coming together to address this issue. We see that the climate doesn't doesn't divide itself by jurisdictions, right? And so what you're bringing up is exactly what we would like to address. So how can we look at our region as a whole in terms of emissions, in terms of also rebates, in terms of funding and applying that across the region? And we really do use 3CE as an example of what we would hope to achieve in terms of this effort, in terms of it, the the broad-based, what you were talking about, Supervisor McPherson, in terms of just the the scale of engagement in 3CE, we're hoping to achieve that because we can't do it all alone, as Director Dave Reed said. Yeah, it's true. We can't do it all alone. I mean, I think Supervisor Friend was right to talk about um, how you know we've got to work with businesses as well as another um, you know note is getting out to all their employees and incentivizing them to either let employees work remotely or um, you know, help find alternatives. Um, finally, you know the the cap mentions two year objectives and how we're really going to look at this on a two year cycle. Um, you know, so I, I suppose if we're, I was doing the math around where we'd have to be by 2025, right? Um, somewhere down around 575,000 metric tons. Um, but I, I didn't see an explicit goal anywhere in, I mean, that was assuming a linear progression, right? And maybe uh, it's, you know, we're going to get a lot of this stuff in the works and then all of a sudden start to actually see the impact of it. Um so when are, did I miss something as far as those objectives? Are they going to come back to us? When are, when are we actually going to look at the incremental pieces here we can do to, to get where we need to go? Well, first, thank you for doing the math and looking ahead. <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, and yes, we will, what you're asking about is what we will return to your board with um, in April. So we will include those projections and we will, what we will do is we will quantify it for each of the strategies what we expect them to contribute towards that decrease. And we will do that with sufficient time for the board and for the public to review that information. Great. Well, thank you. I think this is a great overview plan. I'm looking forward to getting more details and so we can really dig in in this coming year and start to make some progress. Um, and again, just a thank you to our CAO and county staff for leading the way on the remote work policy because I think that uh, has really taken, ma making a big difference really quickly. Thank you. If there's no other comments from the board. We'll open it now for public comment. Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. This is a public comments, last item. You know, this conversation reminds me of degrees I got almost 30 years ago, a geology degree, a physical anthropology, and a cultural anthropology degree. Laughable. Learned a lot since then. So let's just talk about some solutions. Um, I'm not going to mention the first one. How about we re reintroduce what was stopped in 1987 in this county? And that's where they took the exhaust from coal-fired power plants and pumped them into algae beds where they produced an oil, 60% of the weight of the algae that could be jet fuel, kerosene, or diesel. At the time, that was 125 to 400 times more efficient than any other land product, and that's vertical acre, except for hemp. You know, we can thank uh, William Randolph Hearst in 1937 for outlawing hemp. It's almost a complete replacement for um, all oil except high temperatures. You know, we're talking about all this energy and how this infrastructure is actually going to be done. I think the only way it's really going to be done is by reducing the population. And unfortunately, that's happening for many reasons that I won't talk about. But there are some technologies. One can go back to patents in the 1870s, different magnetic technologies. And where do I think that's being used right now? 
Russia has a submarine that's 605 feet long, and by its shape and by the fact that it can, it says it can travel at 125 knots, but there's information that it can travel at 175 knots underwater. That could only be magnetic drive, and that's a free energy source. So yes, you absolutely do need to shield it from it, but it's a lot easier than shielding from radiation. So I'd rather talk about solutions than kind of be funny than other stuff that's on my mind. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. And don't believe a word I say, do your own research. And anyone who wants to make a comment, go ahead and form a queue. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Nieves, and I am one of the interns who helped develop the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan presented here today. And I could speak with these two minutes about how important this plan is or about all the effort and research that went into it, but I'm sure that you already know that. You've seen how much these people care, and you've had the opportunity to meet all of the employees that have so much care and compassion for our community. And so instead, I would like to send a message out to anyone who is willing to listen to me. And that is that change is possible and it can begin with anyone. And I've seen this happen myself. And it was during the creation of the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. We banded together as a group with people from all sorts of different levels of power. We had the agriculture commissioner himself working alongside us interns and helped us create such a wonderful plan that's hopefully going to lead us into a much better future. And the success of this plan is going to be made possible from this cooperation. And so to anyone here who has any ideas, I would like to encourage you, let this be a call to action. Bring forth your ideas. And to those of you who are in positions of power, please empower these voices. Let them realize their visions so that they can help create our better community. Please become the change you want to see in, in the world and in our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Yavez. Bring that down. Good afternoon. If you just I, lower the mic, we can hear you. Thank you. I am Jennifer Hernandez, a climate policy intern who helped in the development of the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, an experience I hold dearly due to the amount of inspiration it has brought me. Coming from a family of farm workers living in South County, it was difficult to fathom being a part of the government at my age and experience. But as I further went with the internship, I felt myself flourishing, being more open-minded, and ready to use my passion for advocacy for the better. It brought me insight into the possibilities as well as hope. The CAP is a plan to take action as a group with the desired outcome to diminish a large number of greenhouse gas emissions. And as a member of the youth, working on this plan has reassured me that while working together, there will be a potential to create a livable future for future generations. Now, the CAP surely holds great power to help diminish greenhouse gases for these upcoming years, but something I didn't see so prominent in the process was conversations of other perspectives in the county. There was a divide between North and South County, but that is due to the lack of diversity present within the county hierarchy. I understand there are others who were not present in the process, but it correlates with how the higher you are in power, the less of a diverse group there is. Something I see for the future is a decrease of the present ba barrier that limits how much we talk and understand other areas. And by saying other areas, I am not just meaning place, but rather reality in different parts of the communities overall. Having multiple members of different communities within the county work together can really present an idea and say it is equitable. Although at first, this understanding of the system within government brought fear to me, it has now been transformed into determination and passion. Environmentalism has always been an interest of mine, as well as being an advocate for my community. And so I will combine both as my passions in life. Now, I am not the representative of Watsonville, but I am one of many and more to come. Thank you, Ms. Fernandez. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen McLaughlin. 
and I'm a climate policy intern working with the OR3. As a graduate student in environmental science, the task of tackling climate change can be daunting, but overall inspires urgency as the world, the action that we take today determines what world we pass on to future generations. Prior to graduate school, I was a wildlife biologist for seven years, working with various endangered species. I've had spotted owls flying close, looking for food as their old growth forest habitat shrinks. I've seen stretches of river dry up, preventing steelhead and salmon's return to their native spawning grounds. I encountered a distressed black bear with her cubs, displaced by severe wildfires in 2020. Through these experiences and many more, I was humbled and gained an immense res respect for the wild animals with whom we coexist. Seeing wildlife habitat disappear before our eyes has sparked a sense of purpose within me to protect these animals and their homes. In the CAPS implementation, we must consider non-human species facing climate change. The equity guardrails highlight at-risk populations with no mention of animal populations. There are, there are strategies on conservation and restoration of natural habitats where we address the homes of the animals, but nothing on the protection of species themselves. These strategies could be enhanced by identifying federally protected species to conserve their habitat from further degradation. Animals are at risk communities when considering wildfire prevention and mitigation and should be addressed as such. Wildlife provides a myriad of ecosystem services from cultural significance and education to economic benefits and food security. Though we live in a human-centered society, we can learn so much about the balance of life through stable ecosystems and biodiversity. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rowena and I'm one of the climate policy interns working on the climate action and adaptation plan. I began working on this project back in April and it has been wonderful to see how hard county staff have worked to put this plan together. I'm proud of the plan that OR3 presented today and believe that it will move the county in the right direction for responding to the climate crisis. However, it is important to note that while our greenhouse gas reduction targets are set for 2045, we do not have 23 years to act. We have just over six years left to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. When the board was updated on the CAPS progress in August, I came up here to give public comment about how the plan needs to make a significant impact that goes beyond the planning stages and into implementation. Now is the time for that to happen. On January 29th, 2019, the board declared a climate emergency. In the time since, you have approved the formation of OR3, approved the sustainability update, and now you have the updated cap before you for approval. These initiatives are all proactive steps towards increasing the county's preparedness to face the impacts of climate change. The incoming board will need to step up during implementation for the cap and sustainability update and fund these projects with a level of urgency that matches your previous declaration. You have declared an emergency, but must now follow through on that by staffing these initiatives as an emergency, promoting them as an emergency, and allocating resources to them as an emergency. You as the board are representatives and members of our community, and you have the power to make these amazing and necessary changes. And I urge you to no longer compromise on issues that affect our planet and our future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ramina. Uh, hello, my name is Eloy Ortiz. I'm here on behalf of Rehanadacion, uh, Pajaro Valley Climate Action. Our organization wanted to thank you and your and the county staff and your interns for their enthusiasm in preparing such a comprehensive uh, report and keeping equity in mind when preparing the report. Our work uh, focuses on informing residents about the impacts that climate change is having in their day-to-day -day lives and also being a leader in the community with public and other nonprofit agencies. Uh, I wanted to inform you, um, I've been a researcher in South County and I've worked with uh, various nonprofits and we are already seeing uh, the impact of climate change on the most vulnerable, vulnerable populations, that being with the farm workers. 
Uh, we're seeing the reduction in hours uh, that the farm, work, work, farm workers are um, able to work. So you have a, already a low resource population whose hours are decreasing more on a yearly basis because of the drought. Uh, we're seeing with um, you know the heat waves, we're seeing people who, again, low resources, they're out in the fields because if they don't work, they're not they're not feeding their kids so they're out there and they're fainting there's not enough um you know there are not enough guardrails when they're actually out in the fields working to help them when they have health issues so um i just wanted to thank you for again for uh keeping that equity in mind and hopefully you know figuring out some figuring out some uh possibilities resources for for these for our most vulnerable populations here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. I'm Susan Worth, a senior living in Rodeo Mobile Estates, here for another measure on a different matter coming up, I hope. But I'm concerned about the complacency of <laughs> the American people. And I've heard that California and New York both have a no idling rule, law. And I see people idling for hours on end. And I've tried to get the city hall to put a no idling sign or a couple of them up right next to city hall. Capitola Community Center, I've I almost got arrested for trying to get a woman to turn her engine off. If, Capitola parking lot at the community center. But I'm telling you, I just, I don't understand why people are so complacent, just let their engines blow. And I think we need a lot of no idling signs around. I think it might help. Just a quickie. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Amhorst. I sit on the Commission on the Environment representing the uh, 5th District here in Santa Cruz County. Um, I just want to take a little time to re reiterate the uh, Commission on the Environment support for the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan uh, submitted here today. I wanted to thank, too, Tatiana, Brennan, and David Reed, and her entire staff. Um, I, I had the honor of attending one of the meetings, and they're a dedicated group, as you can see, from the, uh, from the, from the young people that have come up and, and really put a lot of work into this plan in such a compressed kind of time frame. Um, I'd also like to emphasize the urgency or reemphasize the urgency regarding its implement, implementation and execution. You know, I ask that everyone take into consideration the climate action and adapt, adaptation plan when considering any and all decisions that anyone might make regarding county business. So please think about this document each and every day. Um, additionally, I know you all understand that funding will be critical to the success of this plan, and I'm sure you all know as well that our investments now in actions and adaptations will be far cheaper than the consequences of our inactions later. So thank you all for your support. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Santa Cruz County, and I had the honor of being allowed to serve on the uh, County Water Commission's working group for SB 552. It was a great honor, and I really want to thank um, Ms. Ryan and the, those who worked on that together. Um, our, our county's efforts are leading the state. We are way ahead of where a lot of counties are with SB 552. I, I just want to note that I have not heard the city of Scotts Valley or the city of Capitola mentioned, and this is a collaborative effort. So I'm wondering why they're not at the table, and I hope they are, and I hope they will be. I want to also say that the Native American tribes are still here. They're just silent. <laughs> and I would like to ask this board to um, consider having a Native American uh, ad hoc committee to vet all of this so that uh, they are still here and their voices are heard. Regarding the drought response plan, I wanna make it clear to you that the working group's concern was that SB 552 was a one size fits all effort by the state and does not necessarily fit here in its entirety. 
The committee was very concerned about forced consolidations, especially on small water companies that may not have large financial reserves and on uh, privately owned domestic well owners. So that was very clear. And I believe that um, the commission is in agreement on that and that that spirit will carry through in whatever happens in the future. The well ordinance really needs to be reworked to limit large pumpers with junior water rights from extracting large amounts that cause small water companies and private wells to go dry in times of drought. We also need to honor the public trust as your board has been alerted to, and I'm out of time to have a lot more, but I'll try to write it to you and hope you'll listen. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Steinbrenner. Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Chen Mills, and I'm a climate activist here in Santa Cruz County and around the nation. I've been to D.C. to lobby for a climate tax, spoken with many of our elected representatives and senators in D.C. Um, I really appreciate the work that's gone into this um, climate action plan and adaptation plan. And I haven't been able to read the whole thing, but I'm excited to do that. I wanted to express my appreciation for what Zach friend talked about and also Greg Caput in terms of the urgency and how quickly we can get things done. Um, Greg Caput talked about tipping points. And I think that the current scientific consensus is that we are either very near tipping points from which we will not be able to return, or we are now in the midst of tipping points. Um, carbon dioxide parts per million is hovering around 417 in the atmosphere. At 420, that's when a lot of scientists say we will not be able to come back. And that could happen within a year. So this is how urgent the matter is. And I didn't think I would speak today, but I thought, well, since I'm here and I came down here, I'll take the opportunity. Um, the other piece that I haven't heard mentioned, and I'm looking forward to reading the report, is about what the agricultural community can do. We have so much ag land here that could go into organic and regenerative agriculture that would help to support species, speaking of species and wildlife, and could also tremendously draw down uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere too. So I'm excited to look at that. I really am feeling all the hard work that went into this. I know that we're an exemplary county. I think that at this point, we have to be actually better than exemplary. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Ms. Chen Mills. Good after Board of Supervisors. Afternoon, Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO. As one of the project sponsors for the CAP, I would be remiss not to do some specific acknowledgement of Dave and Tatiana. Yes, it took a county village to put this, put this proposal before you today, but there are two people who are really at the heart of it. And to do it in less than a year uh, is quite remarkable. I wanna thank Mr. Reed as our OR3 director and co-project sponsor. It was great to see Dave um, utilizing all the facets of his county career from DPW, uh, his time as a board super, board analyst supervisor, and really the funnest part is watching him as a coastal geologist, earth science guy, help us bring a complex science um, into reasonable understandings for everyone. And I absolutely have to uh, express my gratitude and appreciation for Ms. Brennan. We were so fortunate when Tatiana returned to the CAO OR3 family last October and signed on as our OR3 senior analyst for climate change and resilience. I am thankful for her openness to make a pivot from the crisis of homelessness to the crisis of climate change and accept the challenge to lead our CAP development. Uh, you've heard all about the plan and, and the engagement processes, our, our climate action um, internship program that she put together, but it really is her professionalism, her dedication to excellence in all things, and her continuing commitment to learn and improve in everything she does that informed our process along the way. We look forward to working with all of you to make this even better and make it be something we work on every day. So thank you, team. Thank you, Assistant CAO Benson. Chair Koenig, members of the board, my name is John Hunt. I currently serve as chair of your Commission on the Environment. And I want to thank you for receiving and listening and for Supervisor McPherson to reference our 
letter on uh, in support of the cap and commending um, the OR3 staff and for conducting a process that reached across 10 departments within the county and brought in dozens of experts and connected with both the community and neighboring entities that are doing similar work. Um, this is very much in the spirit of what we were supporting in July of 2019 when we recommended to the board that the county hire a climate action manager to coordinate across departments. And we're very happy to see this level of coordination across the departments. I think it's going to be very effective. Um, I have a number of things to say, but I think what I'll, what I'll just focus on is the uh, state legislation, SB 32 and AB 1279, I think should not be looked at as mandates, but as opportunities and an open portal of, of conversation from the local governments to the state. I think they are asking us for innovation. I think the innovation is going to come from the local agencies and from the local communities in terms of neighborhood scale, microgrids, and, and customer-based uh, power, power development. And finally, I just want to say that, um, as we said in our letter, and I'll just read two sentences, um, the commission understands and hopes the board and the public will recognize that not every action envisioned in this plan will lead to success, nor does the plan yet contain all possible actions. It is far more important to be ambitious and lead bravely and collaboratively now than to get preoccupied with perfection. So I very much appreciate the flexible nature of this and hope that we will all take the steps forward and not worry about uh, perfectionism. Let's get going and lead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hahn. All right, if there's no one else here in chambers or to comment, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, we do have some speakers online. Jean, your microphone is now available. Hello, Board of Supervisors. I have reviewed uh, the cap and the hard work and the excellence in the presentation today. Um, I'm very pleased to see the emphasis in the cap on the county's urban forest. This is especially important because the $105 million that David Reed mentioned earlier will be used to deforest 1.6 miles of segment nine of the rail corridor. Um, we don't know how many trees are going to come down in segments 10, 11, and 12. The problem is that those 396 trees of segment nine currently act every day to sequester carbon and give us oxygen to breathe in exchange, how nice. When those trees are felled then, and then shipped or decay, they will release their carbon, their sequestered carbon into the atmosphere. We will also bulldoze living soil throughout the corridor, also releasing its carbon into the atmosphere. This proposed um, tree felling deforestation of our urban forests, in my mind, contradicts the cap. Does it not? So I think it's time to rethink whether this is wise. It certainly can't be called green. And just one last comment about our so-called carbon-free uh, electricity from the triple C, which I really support that program. I really do. Uh, but nothing is carbon free. It takes fossil fuel to build windmills. It takes fossil fuel to build solar panels. It takes fossil fuel to establish them, to set them up, and to build the, the road infrastructure from them. But I just want everybody to remind there's no such thing as carbon free. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bronkelbank. Lonnie, your microphone's now available. Thank you, Chair and County Supervisors. Equity Transit thanks Tatiana Brennan and the numerous county planners, staff, and analysts involved in creating this comprehensive cap and for taking seriously the climate crisis that we are amidst, the cascade of extinctions and events generated by human activities on this planet has grown so severe, we have little time to shift our course away from what is being called the sixth greatest great extinction. Our addiction to private automobiles and commercial trucks began at the greedy hands of industries 
that aggressively destroyed our once great world-class public transit systems like the key in the Bay Area and the Pacific Electric Railway red cars in Los Angeles operating from 1901 to 1961. It covered over 1,100 miles of track with 900 electric trolley cars. These all electric clean transportation systems formed once the world's most extensive interurban system right here in the United States. Our robust clean public transit systems were destroyed against the will of the public starting in the 1940s. This calculated decimation was segregation by design. Highways were built through the backyards and bedrooms of redlined black and brown communities and systematized racism and classism across the United States while reducing opportunities even today for elderly young people, people with disabilities, low income, people of color, essential workers, and those who cannot or do not drive but must physically be at work. For example, our nurses. Robust public transportation benefits our economy, our equity, and the environment. The natural resources to outfit every person in an e-car are extreme, and electric cars have toxic tires and other toxic materials that contribute to greenhouse gas gases and leach toxins into our air, water, and soils, leading to numerous health issues. We hope the county cap will support bus metro and clean passenger rail connecting with the state rail network. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Brian, your microphone's now available. Thank you very much. My name is Brian Lockwood. I am um, serving as supervisor Capitz appointee and chairing the Santa Cruz County Water Advisory Commission. I appreciate you all taking the time to hear this important item today. I just wanted to um, chime in and apologize. I can't be there in person, but I have a PV water board meeting that starts at the top of the hour. Um, but I want to take a moment to commend Santa Cruz County staff for the excellent work that they've done in preparing the climate action plan. I know PV Water, I'm the general manager of the water management agency down here in South County as well. We've participated in some of the climate action planning effort. And we've um, participated in the development of the Santa Cruz County Drought Response and Outreach Plan, which I think was a, an excellent effort all around, um, bringing in various members of the community to help with this important effort. As the drought continues on, there is a real risk of wells running out of water, and we do need to find mechanisms to ensure that folks have the ability to access water at all times. So I think incorporating the, the drought response and outreach plan into the climate action plan made sense. And I think the effort was very good. And again, uh, appreciate all of the hard work of county staff. And, and I interested, I was um, enjoyed hearing from all the folks who have worked on it, supporting staff, all the interns that were in the queue speaking to the board just uh, moments ago. A great effort all around. Thank you again and um, have a good day. Thank you, Chair Lockwood. Maggie, your microphone's now available. Hi, um, my name's Maggie Alma, and I worked on the CAP as a representative for the uh, Santa Cruz Sierra Club group, and I found the process to be very thorough. We worked with people throughout the county, and in um, the two sessions that I participated in, people were um, listened to and their input was taken to heart. I did call um, back with some more information every time I reached out. All of the things that I um, suggested were listened to and were well received and most importantly i feel that the fact that the climate um caap is looking at a very short time span in terms of the turnaround i feel that that they are taking the climate emergency in, um in seriously because it, um, they look at it as a moving target rather than looking at it as something that they have to reach far into the distant future and that in my opinion is really the crux of all of the work that these amazing people have put into it and i highly recommend that you approve this plan thank you thank you Ms. alma beverly your microphone's now available Hi, Beverly Day Show with the Electric Vehicle Association of the Central Coast. Um, so 70% of our emissions are from 
vehicles. I didn't hear much in the way of solutions. The building of new buildings uh, to get people closer to where they work. No, most of Santa Cruz is, well, the county, I guess, is not already built out. But no, that's not going to do it. <laughs> um, so to raise the price of gas to stop people from using cars, no, who, people who have money, they can pay that. People who don't, this is an equity issue here. They will be burdened. Um, to reduce parking, to stop people from having cars, no. That just means people will be driving around. Or as in San Francisco, they will park and double park and leave their car running. Um, uh, to uh, Supervisor Caput, all plastics ever made still exist on the planet. There is no way for them to go away yet. Um, uh, let's see. The ag industry could be doing regenerative agriculture, which uh, has, the, has the benefit of sequestering carbon and has the benefit of up to 40%, excuse me, up to 50% uh, holding of the water. So 50% reduction of water use. Uh, to measure how much uh, we are traveling uh, for vehicle miles traveled by gas sales. No, there are people, we have lots of visitors and people are going outside of the county with their vehicles. So that is not an accurate measure. I also didn't hear, but it may be in the plan, uh, what the county is doing to um, electrify its grid, excuse me, its fleet. Thank um, you, Mr. Shaw. Kathleen, your microphone is now available. <laughs> Yes, I'm using Kathleen's tablet. This is Woody Rahanick of Safe Ag, Safe Schools and the Campaign for Organic and Regenerative Agriculture. Uh, in, in 2020, Santa Cruz County had 64,000 acres of ag and ranch land, an area twice the size of San Francisco, and about 7,000 acres were farmed or ranched organically with healthy living soil and microbial activity, which stores carbon. Um, I sent the supervisors an article that was in Sunday's Lookout Santa Cruz, an op-ed piece I wrote, which explains in more detail. But I think that it's really important to include in our inventories of carbon, uh, zero carbon targets, the potentials of healthy living soils. Now, I asked a team of three blue ribbon uh, soil scientists today in a workshop. My question was, can current technology measure soil organic matter uh, content to determine the carbon storage in metric tons per acre with that precision? And their answer, the, long an the short answer was no, but the technology is being developed to do that. So we're working with estimates, but we do know from in the field, on hand experience that a great deal of tonnage of carbon can be sequestered in healthy living soils. So I urge the, the supervisors to take that into consideration uh, among all the hard work that's already been done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rahanek. Call in user ending in 1416. Your microphone is now available. Um, hi, this is Linda Marin. I'm with um, Citizens Climate Lobby Santa Cruz chapter. And um, I want to just first appreciate um, what uh, Supervisor Koning said in his mention of um, taxing carbon. I, I would agree that that is the most useful and quickest way to bring emissions down. Um, but to address your concern, Beverly, um, I would only support such a thing if, if there were a robust dividend that covered about 60% of people from the lower end of the ex economic spectrum on, um, because that would, of course, be the only fair way to do it. But since we, as you mentioned, can, uh, um, Supervisor Koning, we can't, um, make a countywide carbon fee uh, or a pollution fee 
Um, what we can do is some of the things that um, have been mentioned here, and I just want to lift up um, the idea of resource conservation districts, um, whereby my understanding is that um, the notion of regenerative agriculture, or at least that title, is not as welcome as the idea of healthy soils, which really is exactly the same thing um, in different language. And I'm just hoping that that notion of healthy soils runs deep in our work um, of uh, creating a lot more healthy um, organic agriculture in our county. Um, and I also want to list up something Amy Chen said and that many of the interns um, about urgency because uh, this is wonderful work that we're doing in Santa Cruz and I'm full of uh, appreciation, but um, I think that probably we are, from everything I understand, in the middle of tipping point. So we can't hurry enough. And I'm, I'm appreciating all of you who are working hard and, um, and we need to do it faster. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marin. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then I'll return to the board for deliberation and action. Mr. Chair, I'd um, just like to summarize. I really appreciate, again, every, the comments that were made, and especially for us addressing what we can do immediately uh, right away. Uh, but in general, I, I think Santa Cruz County can be very uh, pleased with where we are in addressing climate change today. And I think we will be equally excited and how more advanced we can be in the future. We need to keep our eye on the ball. We've done this in quick fashion and it's been, and uh, this, this county is excited about doing this and, and addressing the issues, you, issues more pr predominantly right away as, we, as soon as we can to make us, if not carbon free, sir, certainly carbon reduced uh, community and county. Um, a lot, a lot of work has gone into this. There's much more to do. We, we, we know that. We know that. We have a lot to catch up to correct. So there's a lot to do. But with that, I, I would like to move that we accept this um, CAP report and um, return on April 25th uh, with an update on uh, how we might plan and implement some of the charges that have been presented today and especially want to thank Mr. Reed, Ms. Brent, for what they have done and how they've really organized this and capitalized it, uh, capsulized it as well as you can. Thank you very much. I'll second that. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Um, just to clarify, your motion is for uh, all the recommended actions? Yes. All right. Uh, all right. Quick comment, too. Sure. All right. We do have a motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, it's. I'll make this quick. Uh, it's some good news. Uh, about five years ago, uh, we went to my son's uh, little league baseball game in Watsonville, and then uh, about halfway through the game, uh, the pitcher looks up in the sky, and then the uh, shortstop, and then all of a sudden the batter looks up and the umpire comes out and we're all now I'm in the stands with my daughters and my wife and we're all looking up at two beautiful American bald eagles circling the field. Uh, the huge wingspans. I, I never saw anything quite like that. Uh, they, they are in the Watsonville area, so I hope they're doing well. But uh, it was quite a sight. Uh, they stopped the game for about five minutes. Everybody was just watching, and then they flew off. So uh, there, we can make things a little bit better if we can bring back the American bald eagle. We can, we can do this. We can make everything better. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, do you have a motion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. To comment on this item is very clear how important it is to our entire community. Thank you. All right, we do have one last item today, which is 
Item 11, to consider approval and concept of ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code Section 1332.030 and 1332.040F and 1332.060 relating to general and special rent adjustments for mobile home parks. And schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on January 10th, 2023. And for a presentation on this item, uh, this is actually was submitted by Supervisor Friend and myself. So. Supervisor Friend, if you'd like to introduce this. Sure, I don't have a presentation, but I'd be happy to introduce the item. As the board knows, uh, Santa Cruz County, in particular, our organization of Santa Cruz County, um, has been a statewide leader in protecting mobile home residents and uh, the value of an affordable housing stock uh, that it provides, in particular for seniors and low-income families within our community. Uh, some years back, Terry Hancock, with, the, with working with uh, local attorney, I believe he's here, Will Constantine, helped draft our ordinance, which um, has been used as a model across the state and some other communities that didn't have as, as robust of an ordinance, including two jurisdictions within our county, haven't had as much success protecting residents. Uh, over time, there have been some needs to make some changes. Uh, Supervisor Koenig and myself brought forward a change last year uh, to clarify some language that was actually the intent of the original ordinance. And this time, uh, we're bringing forward something that will strengthen the protections uh, in regards to how these increases are done by park owners, in particular, uh, tying it to the CPI as opposed to this 10% provision, which isn't really tied to anything. Um, and secondly, working on a process that ensures that uh, any challenges to these kinds of increases are, are done through a process that limits litigation possibilities. This has been a pretty extensive amount of work to make sure that what we did was the right draft. It's possible over the course of time, we'll need to relook at this again because it's an evolving situation. And as you can imagine in my district, and I know also in Supervisor Koenig's district, there have been a number of challenges and, and a number of, of pressure that's been put on, on park residents just in the last few years, including at Pinto Lakes, uh, where we successfully defended um, those low-income residents from unfair increases. So uh, let me just also thank a couple of people that worked extensively on this. Suzanne Yang in County Council's office, did an unbelievable amount of work. Uh, appreciation to Will Constantine, who's been a consistent and strong voice for uh, mobile home residents throughout the state and as a statewide leader, um, both Supervisor Koenig and my, my, uh, our mobile home commissioners, Henry Cleveland and Jane Brocklebank have provided guidance over the course of just, not specifically on this ordinance, but over the course of, of the last year for the need and unquestionably uh, Allison Violante in my office who um, did a significant amount of work over the last few months on this. Um, this board is, uh, what we're asking this board to do is to uh, help with this cleanup language and, that we're providing today in order to ensure that these protections exist moving forward. I've got, if you've got any specific questions, uh, Supervisor Koenig or myself is, are happy to answer it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. I'll just add that you know this, our, our mobile home park rent adjustment ordinance was clearly written uh, at, at a different time when it, it, in expectations around inflation were uh, a little different. I mean, even with the high inflation we've experienced this past year, we've had you know an eight percent um, range, but certainly not a ten percent, uh, and certainly not ten percent every year the way this ordinance our, our ordinance currently plans for. So it's clear that uh, we it makes a lot more sense to tie uh, operational increases to a consumer price index that. Um, that we now expect to go up and down every year. Um, furthermore, I think this improved resolution process uh, really just makes a lot more uh, a lot more sense. It, it creates opportunities for park owners and residents to reach an agreement without costly litigation by, by bringing in an expert early who is a CPA. Both sides will have a chance to consider the facts regarding why special rent adjustment is necessary. Uh, and then there's even a second point where if they don't agree, they, they go to a hearing officer uh, who will also assess those facts. So hopefully this will save everyone time and money. Um, and you know, last I do want to acknowledge that the role the mobile uh, mobile home and manu mobile and manufactured home commission has to play in this. You know, these amendments are coming straight to the board because time is of the essence. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't want the commission's input. And I hope that they will have a special meeting to provide us their recommendation before this is finalized in the second uh, at the second read on January tenth. Um, and finally, I also would definitely like to. Um, second, Supervisor Friends, uh, thanks for Suzanne Yang and County Council, uh, Second District Analyst Allison Violante, uh, and Will Constantine's work on this. Any other Chair, comments or questions? Yeah, I, I think you've answered the question. Let's see. Um, but I, I'm, 
is there reason to have specified that we ha have to have a CPA on it? I'm afraid we're going to lose a member that's been associated with this for many years and is really an expert at it. But um, uh, you've answered it that you wanted that. I just, um, you know, if I don't know if it could be, it'd be recommended that we have a somebody with CPA, but to require it, I'm just uh, a little concerned about it. Supervisor Friend, did you want to clarify? Yeah. So uh, th this isn't, this is, I mean, just to make sure that we're on the same page, uh, Supervisor McPherson, this isn't regarding the mobile home commission membership. This is just specific on, on what the expert, uh, when we move into a period, if there's a dispute over the yeah. rent increase, uh, this brings in an expert component. Um, and what the ordinance tries to do is define uh, who an expert is. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, I think what's important here is that we get the ordinance approved, that we we change the 10% component into the CPI, and that we can clean up if, if, for example, the CPI element of an expert is too limiting, then I think that that's something that this board could continue, uh, Supervisor Koenig, Chair Koenig and I could work on uh, cleanup language in the new year to, to make that more broad we do we should define what an expert is i mean it helps define what it is but this doesn't this doesn't limit membership within uh, anything that the county does this is just specific to whether it goes to an expert should the rent challenges be excuse me should the rent increase be challenged i i i'm fully on board with what you what you're doing and um but i accept your your comments uh can be discussed further in the future um uh, it's a vital thing and i appreciate your efforts to update this and what's needed so thank you Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. All right, if there's no other comments from members of the board, is there any member of the public wishes to comment on this item? I'm Will Constantine, and I'm here on behalf of the Bay Federal Credit Union. And uh, we've been involved in this process, as Supervisor Friend has stated. So I'd like to thank both his office and Supervisor Koenig's office for everything that you've done on this and everybody else on the board of supervisors for um, the great amount of support you've given to mobile homeowners, you know, over the last 40 years now, um, you know, it's been wonderful. Um, without your support with mobile home rent control and closure protection, um, you would have lost thousands of homes already that are affordable to low and moderate income um, families that are here now. Um, so I just wanted to say that this has been a long process. We may have to do a little bit of cleanup, as he said later, um, but we need this now and it's timely. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Constantine. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom just comment on this item? Yes, we do have speakers online. Casey, your microphone's now available. Can I, sorry, I just want to interrupt briefly, which is I have to leave in five minutes. So I would love to support this. I think it has unanimous support. So for the speakers on Zoom, um, if you, unless you have something substantive, we have five members of the board who are ready to to vote and, and unanimously move this forward, I think. Um, so I just want to make that comment. Thank you. Okay. Casey, your microphone is still available. Okay, that being said, I will be very brief and I just want, I'm a mobile home owner in Rodale Gulch Estates um, and we're thrilled that you're taking this up and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Jean, your microphone's now available. Also very quickly, this is Jean Brocklebank. And uh, although I am the vice chair of the county's advisory body, the Mobile Home Commission, I'm speaking only for myself today as a 33 year resident of a mobile home park. First, I'd like to thank Supervisor Koenig uh, for mentioning um, the value of our Mobile Home Commission. I really appreciate that. I also uh, found uh, the work by Suzanne Yang of County Council exemplary, uh, wonderful work. Needless to say, Will Constantine also. And I'm glad that Supervisor Friend and Koenig brought this before you. I approve these amendments in general, absolutely. I have one little outstanding concern, but I think it's something we can resolve next year so we can continue forward today with this current process. Well done, all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Lyle, your microphone's now available.
It's star six to mute or unmute yourself, Lyle, if you'd like to go ahead and accept the unmute. The speaker's unmuted, but doesn't appear to be making any noise. This is our final speaker. Um, last call for Lyle, if you are able to speak. Okay, well, um, thank you for ever showing up anyway, Lyle. All right, I'll now return to the board for deliberation and action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second, motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Caput? Aye. Thank you. Yeah. And McPherson? And Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Item passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our regular meeting today. Our last meeting of this year, the next meeting of the board, will be January 10th, 2023. Happy holidays, everyone. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.